Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, episode 148, Flood of Questions, AMA. I'm Sean S., and with me, as always, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, the RPG maitre d', answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Remember, we record live Wednesday nights at 9 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. So it's been a while, and Deanna and I have been really busy tracking a couple of Amazon sales this week, and we're all dealing with back-to-school chaos. So I thought it'd be a good time and a good night for an AMA, and Ask Us Anything, Ask Me Anything, whatever you want to call it, a live Q&A. So during our Ask the Bellhop segment tonight, we will be opening the floor to questions from the fine folk who joined us tonight in the lobby. Now, after that, Sean and I will be sharing our thoughts on the Wrath expansion for Draconis Invasion. Then I've got my initial thoughts on Roll Camera and a return to Castles of Burgundy. Welcome to the Suggestion Box. Here we highlight some of our interactions with you fine folk. While we don't read all the comments here on the show, know that we appreciate all of your feedback tremendously. Our first comment this week comes from Martin Vos, and it's on our Great Western Trail unboxing video. Martin writes, excellent timing. I just played my first game of Great Western Trail yesterday. It reminds me a lot of big fiddly games like Cuba, Vinos, Kalos, etc., except Great Western Trail has a lot more walking around on the board. Well, thanks for the comment, Martin. Uh, We've only actually played twice so far, but are really digging it. And you're right. It's in that medium heavyweight range that Deanna and I actually really enjoy. One of the interesting things about this one is that whole walking, the fact that you are traveling a path or choosing a path from one end of the board to the other to deliver your cattle. And when you start off, you cycle it super quick. Like I think you can actually do it in two turns if you really want to the first time around. But then as buildings start getting added to the pass and obstacles start showing up, it takes longer and longer to complete that path. And the game actually slows down as it goes on because of this. And I also dig the fact that you can kind of set your own pace. And that's actually a very important part of the strategy of the game. And different strategies can work based on how other people are playing. Like, do you rush through trying to ship as many cattle as you can as often as you can? Or do you take your time so that your herd's like perfectly curated by the time you get to the the train so you get the most points? And what's better? Firing off lots of quick ones for low point value or getting that one big point score is a huge part of that game. And that's actually what I love the most about Great Western Trail. All right, well, next up, Joseph Teller commented on our advice for starting up a community event to say, with COVID still on the rise, not happening here anytime this year. Yeah, I told you to get you on that one, Joseph. Um, When we recorded that episode, cases were actually dropping significantly here in Ontario. It was actually looking pretty good. Uh, Specifically in Windsor, we actually had two days in a row with no cases at all around that time. Unfortunately, that's now turned into a fourth wave, I guess. Everyone's calling it now, and things aren't looking good at all. Um, I think we might have been a little too optimistic and premature covering public play events at that time. So to be honest, the advice there still stands once things do eventually open up. Well, next up, a comment from one of our awesome Patreon patrons, Math Guy Dave, had this to say about our mapping software suggestions from last week. This is probably the best topic for me in quite a while. Dungeon Scrawl, you summed up well. It is just so much fun. I love drawing stuff on there. One more I thought of is the Discord bot Dungeon, but it's too late and I haven't used it since Dungeon Scrawl came out. I used to use it for the random dungeon game I was running. So I did come up with a few Discord bots as well as a number of map generators for virtual tabletops. Like in Roll20, you have something where you can design maps live while you're running the game or ahead of time and import them and stuff like that. So when looking at these tools, I kind of avoided those. I was looking for software that made maps as opposed to software that did other things that also let you make maps. But those are definitely valid options. Uh, one of the main reasons we did skip them is, I well, except for playing, running one game where I think I drew one box, I don't really have enough familiarity with the online tools to know how good they'd be at mapping. Well, sticking with the same topic of mapping software, Bob Lai says, I'm so old school, my dungeons used to be on graph paper. 
And while we knew that comment was coming from someone at some point, thanks, Bob, for filling in the trope. Well, next up, a comment from our unfair ABDW review, right from the designer themselves, Joel Finch. I'm glad you enjoyed the expansion. A great review. Thank you. One detail that might be helpful with the B-movie panoramas, the shape-shifting thing sideshow attraction can be substituted for any panorama section so that you don't mm. need to be assigned the necessary super attraction in order to complete the panorama. Okay. The binoculars upgrade is also available to let you search the deck for any pieces you're missing, which helps reduce the randomness around panos. Well, thanks, Jeff, for the comment and for pointing these things out. So in the games we played, the only time the shape-shifting thing came up, it was used in a Western theme. And with the Western theme, the panorama is one of the unique things in the Western is the panoramas all combine with each other. So the shape-shifting thing honestly didn't matter at all. It was just another panorama in the middle of the Western one. And I hadn't even considered the fact that in a different setting with a different deck, it could replace a super attraction in a panorama. I just would have never thought that you could duplicate that. But like I said, the super attraction is so rare, right? Everyone only gets two at the beginning of the game. I hadn't even thought about the fact that it could take a super attraction's place because you can only, only have one super attraction. But I get it. It's not a super attraction. It's the shape-shifting thing, which is just makes it look like there's a super attraction there. And I have to say, honestly, I've never seen the binoculars. So that's just a case of we played, We the review was based on a small sample size. I think for that particular case, I think it was six games. We tried to play everything at least five times. And in all those six games, we didn't use the B-movie theme every time. And never once did I draw the binoculars. So thanks for pointing both of those out. I got to admit, that does make panoramas seem much more doable, approachable, and a worthwhile strategy. So I kind of apologize for not actually getting to experience that in the plays we did. But that is the problem with a small sample size. Well, certainly reinforcing our mentions of the importance of mm. deck knowledge in getting the most out of our games of Unfair. Very true. Well, that's it for this week's comments. Send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or hit us up on social media. Well, we're here to answer your game, gaming and game night questions. Tonight, specifically, we're going to be answer, answering questions live from our chat room here on Twitch. While these can include your usual game or game night questions, we do want this to be an AMA or an AUA, so feel free to ask us anything you want. All right, I know the chat room's going to have lots of questions for us, but they're going to need some time to type those out. So what I'm going to do is give the lobbyists a chance to put something into the chat for us to get going on. So we're going to answer a question from our digital mailbag first. Well, tabletop patron Jeff Seuss writes, when we get back to gaming at the FLGS, particularly for public gaming events, what's the one thing, not including the game itself or food, that okay. you're most looking forward to? Gaming with other people is too obvious. So what about okay. gaming with other people is what he's looking for? All right, try to like like really specifying that there. Right? Well, I, I admit, he, he knew what the, the common answers are going to be, right? What are you looking forward to while playing with other people? Or playing games with other people. Or, or the awesome food. Getting... At, <laughs> you know, yeah, or the unfortunately, food our, our food source is gone. I, I, there isn't a local game store with good food anymore. There isn't even a local game store with food, except for like snacks, you know, chocolate bars and stuff. So that'll, that'll be an adjustment. I can't look forward to the food anymore. Well, and we also dream. aren't even sure if there's playing at the FLGS of yes. preference. <laughs> some some have it, some don't. But the ones yeah. I know that do have playing currently do not have food, even though one was a restaurant. But anyway, um, the big thing I am looking forward to is the the advocacy, the sharing the hobby, and not just gaming with people, but letting people experience game, new games. Because the big thing I want to do is I want to show off the new games. There are so many. We should do a podcast episode once this is all done. The best games we discovered during the pandemic. Because there are so many games that were new to us. Like we just talked about Great Western Trail, the Inbox. And that one was fantastic. And yes, new to us. I know we're not new botanists. We've talked about that enough times. I want to show off Space Base. I want to try Space Base with seven people. I want to play um, the party games. Like we got the mind we got just before. What was the other one? There, there's one we played. 
I'm trying to blank. Dude, I want to play Dude with a bunch of people at the local game store at least once before I get rid of the copy and never have to do it again. Um, I, I swear there's another big party. Telestration's upside there on. I've only gotten to play it with the kids. Yeah. Like that is definitely a big group game. Where where's my big group to play Telestrations? So it, it's showing off the new hotness, showing off something I am excited about, something I want to like here, check out this awesome thing and having someone be like, yes, that is awesome. That's the aspect of gaming with people I miss combined with the new person, the, the, the person who moved to Windsor in the last two years, or the gamer who was always too shy to go out, but like they spent a year and a half in the basement, they want to get out and they want to meet some people, or the people who discovered board games and board game arena while all this was going on, who we've been telling, hey, we used to run events, come back out when we can do that big, hey, things are opening up, come and play, and having those people discover new games and meet other local gamers, and then seeing them go on to play, right? Like when I'm seeing the pictures of them playing at home, a game I taught them, that is the best part of this entire thing. So that is what I look forward to the most. So in a way, it's the games, but it's, it's just it's the showing off the games. It's the advocacy. And see, for me, it's, I, you know, he doesn't want us to say gaming with other people. And that's fine, uh, because honestly, I do game with other people. I game with them digitally. I mm -hmm. game online. I game, you know, with uh, through Zoom. I, and I've even started occasionally <laughs> when uh, when time allows to get down and game with Kat and Tori and Mo and D and uh, and, you know, get a little bit of pers in person gaming. But mm. there's just something about um, the face-to-face -face interactions in a game that that aren't reproducible on Zoom or on right. on BGA. There's that you know when you sit down in front of someone, especially someone you have, you don't play with all that often, and and you you feel their emotions across the table, and you feel them their excitement or disappointment or whatever it is. There's that emotional mm -hmm. environment that that comes with playing with other people and it only grows bigger and bigger the the bigger yeah. your groups are uh and that's you know as much as i don't love people and i you know i'm I'm with d keep me away from the crowds but you know there is still a certain level of emotional involvement um and, and you know group emotional group thinks for lack yeah. of a better term that happens when you're out playing at events that you just cannot duplicate mm -hmm. digitally it do doesn't just, it just doesn't work no it doesn't and actually, uh, to, to go along with that, I actually miss the, uh, I'm feeling for the term here too, but the, the gathering of like-minded people, the, the feeling you're with your people, you're with a bunch of others who are into the same thing you have, the feeling of camaraderie, family, I guess it could be, the, the, that group think that way. And I got to admit, personally, I'm, I like crowds. I am a person who feeds off crowds. So I miss the having lots of other people around doing things while I'm doing something. Cause that just feeds me. That fuels me. I, I am definitely a social vampire in that way that I actually, I'd like, I'd love to go to the mall when it was packed, just being around it. And I used to love walking down to the, like, the freedom festival or watching the fireworks down by the river, just to be around all the people and people watch. So there is that aspect of it too, which it doesn't matter even who those people are in that case. That's just being in crowds and feeding off the energy of crowds is definitely something that's, that's, I know that Sean and D don't agree with, but I definitely <laughs> get out of it. I, mean, I may not actually be extroverted, but um, I definitely do uh, feed off crowds. There you go. All right. Well, uh, Tech has a selfish question. Uh, which game will you bring with you that we will play together the next time we can get together? That's from right. Tech2674 in our chat room. Number one's got to be Go Cuckoo because we keep making fun of them for never playing Go Cuckoo. And that's not even a COVID thing. It just never happens. So we got to play Go Cuckoo with Tech. And next, I think, has to be Space Base. Like maybe we'll play through Shy Pluto with him and then he can discover it on his own and I'll get to have the joy of seeing some of that stuff unlocked, not in a two-player game because that, that did make things drag out a bit. And I would love to do the thing. Um, that's all I'm going to say. The thing at the end. I would love to replay the thing at the end one more time. I think that, that, would, that was an enjoyable experience. That's the one thing I might roll back and actually try again at some point with that. So th those are the main ones I can think of. You got anything you want to play with Tech? Uh, I, I think definitely go cuckoo. I, I, yeah. the shot, the fact that he hasn't played it yet is just astounding. Um, I mean, cause we, you've had go cuckoo for, I, I got two? it in 2019. Was it 2019? Well, there wasn't a lot of lone room there before everything shut down. I don't know. Cause I mean, I, I remember origins 2019. Okay. Cause I, cause I remember playing it at least in twice November. in Windsor. Well, you, you played it at easy mode one time and then at extra life. Yeah. Which was all 2019, right? Yeah, that was no, all I guess. leading up to November. Yeah. 
That hasn't um, been that long. Oh, and D saying Shadow Veil. What is Shadow Veil? Isn't Shadow uh, the the new Valeria? Isn't that the new Valeria one? Shadow Shadow, I don't Shadow know Kingdoms what Shadow of Valeria. Veil she's talking no, no. about. Shadow Kingdoms or, of Valeria is the one I'm thinking. Shadow of. Kingdoms of Valeria, maybe. I, I think there is something called Shadow Veil that sounds familiar, but it's not one I'll be able to bring up. I think Shadow Veil is a podcast. I'm not, no, but I'm not sure. I think there is a uh, game called Shadow Veil. Shadow yeah, Kingdoms Shadow of Valeria. Valeria. Yeah, that's it. She she and I were on the same on the same on failure my, page there. Uh, yeah, uh, Shadow Kingdoms of Valeria is good. I, I am looking forward to trying the other one. Sure, Tech can play that. I I I, can, I don't remember him being excited about that one when we were talking about it. Space Space is the big one. Big one. What we have to do when we can meet in person is give Tech a mug. I think is what we should do <laughs> if we can meet in person. We'll find a mug and we'll we'll set you a reasonable price. All right. Uh, here we go. Uh, here we ah, uh, here we go. Math guy Dave asks, "Do you have miniatures for old RPG campaigns saved away somewhere, like a favorite character that lives on a shelf these days?" Yes, yes. Um, I don't play a lot. So I don't have a lot of characters. So most of the characters I have are from D and D Fourth Edition, playing Living Forgotten Realms. Because I've talked before about how I became a Herald level DM and ran hundreds of games locally. Well, before that, we got back into D and D by joining a local table at Hugo and Immune, and Deanna and I played. That's where we met um some some awesome people. Oh, I'm drawing a blank. Chris, I know what, what was the other big guy that was always with Chris. I can't even remember the DM's name. I feel terrible. Dave and his wife. Oh, man. I guess it's been too long. Um, but anyway, when I started playing that, I started collecting D&D miniatures. And at the time, there was still the D&D miniatures game. Like, it was you, you didn't just buy minis. You bought the, the sleeve mixed packs, and there was a game to be played. And what I would do is every new character, I'd find myself a new miniature. Now, some of those came from my old school miniatures. And my first ever character was Ragnar Paxlayer, which was a paladin of Tempest in Living Forgotten Realms. And it was a Warhammer, a Middenheimer, so City of the White Wolf with a big wolf pelt and a huge hammer. And my background was that I killed the wolf. And that was, you know, a coming of age thing. And you had to go into the woods and earn your pelt by surviving. And I had killed the alpha. So I still had, I painted a miniature for that. And actually it's one of my best painted paint jobs ever. Um, then I started going from that to expanding to every time I made a new character, I picked out a miniature and painted it. And then I also bought a set of matching dice. So then they were color coded together. And that to me is still a thing. Like if I was going to play D and D next week, and the campaign was going to go on, I would go find a miniature and I would actually pick up the paints, assuming some of those back there aren't dried out and at least do it. So I have every fourth ed character I played through that campaign. Um, the dice, some of those have gone missing, but I did own at least a D20. Uh, it started with a D20. I usually bought a D20 and a primary damage die. So with Ragnar, he had a D8 Warhammer, but then eventually I got a feat that did D12. So I actually bought a matching color D12, but like I didn't buy a whole set. I just bought the D20 for your attack rolls and everything else in D&D. And then I bought a couple damage dice. When I played a cleric though, I went and spent a fortune because I bought blessed dice for all the players, right? So I have D4 dice because bless at, this, at that time, Bless gave everyone a D4 die. So I went and bought color-coded D4 dice. And then I got whatever the next one, Protection from Evil gave you something. So I got something for that. Um, I also painted up some of these characters for her. I painted up her, her this goes back to D&D 3.5, her half-orc paladin. I painted that one up both, um, stand, did we ever do standard scale or just enlarged? You must have had a standard scale one. I'm, I'm trying to remember. I know, I remember painting up that she used enlarged a lot. That was, that was their combat tactic because the wizard would cast enlarged and she would fight with two two-handed swords, one in each hand. And I, I definitely painted up her big one. And I can't, we must have painted this, the standard scale one too. Or eventually we enlarged permanence her maybe. I can't even remember now. So yeah, I painted up some of these. Uh, these Garrett the Cleric is one of my best paint jobs. That was the first time I tried object source lighting on the holy symbol and it actually turned out really good. So yeah, definitely. Uh, to be honest though, some of them, I couldn't even tell you the characters' names. Like I remember Ragnar because I played him the longest. I actually got him up to like level 18 or something ridiculous like that. But like I also had a thief one or an elf one. I have no idea what that elf was called. All I remember is I, I tried to always talk in rhymes. Never set that limit for yourself. That was way <laughs> too dang difficult. And I spent most of the game barely paying attention to the DM trying to think of rhymes so that I could say something. So that was a bad idea. 
Um, I had a halfling that, that killed the main boss with a spoon, which I love. I've got a miniature for him. I painted up. He's uh, he's trying to be tall, so he's on a special base that I made that's tall to make him as high as the other miniatures. So yeah, definitely, definitely have miniatures of my previous characters. And Deanna's got miniatures going back to the AD and D days. I think she's got a miniature for Teal right over here. Yeah, and, these and then kids. you didn't play with minis. So. No, I never. We we did with two point oh. We didn't play. We didn't really play with minis. Or two point five even. We didn't really use minis. Uh, and I kind of bowed out uh, beyond that. And I was never a big fan of it. Now, possibly because I never played fourth ed. That I I I will admit I never played fourth ed at all. Yeah. And I never got into the the miniature D and D the way you guys did. Uh, which may change my opinion. May have changed my opinion. But yeah, for me, I've always preferred the theater of the mind and that's why I, I love playing on discord and stuff and then you know we don't even we rarely even use maps so but as far as uh people have called these rpg artifacts before we actually had a, talk, a whole we show did. where we talked yes. about rpg artifacts and talked about this uh sean what sean keeps his character sheets yep he's still got all his old characters and not even just character sheets i have like but, workbooks that of you know the calculations i did for a casino that one of my characters was mm -hmm. running and, and and you know the 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 monthly income and how that all came together and things like that um i i keep all that little that that sort of stuff i have a big thick binder of of that sort of stuff yeah see i have some but again i didn't play yeah like you were running then, i didn't play at all like like now i play now and then at least i play at cons um i'll admit i don't keep all my stuff like like i mostly when i play nowadays it's at cons well nowadays being two years ago at this point well, not, a lot of cons you don't get to keep them right it's they're they're reading they want the back, for the next right? con and that is disappointing yeah i i always ask if i can keep them <laughs> and sometimes they say no and to be honest if you are running a game at a con you should ask for them back because you will get more feedback on what people did with that sheet than you will ever get from them telling you stuff you'll look at the sheet and go what the heck all three people noted stuff in this column obviously i need a spot for that or look people obviously thought this wasn't clear because they made notes and they asked me questions like it's amazing what you can learn from a character sheet but i kind of hate the idea because i was someone who always wanted to bring mine home like i want to get home from origins and take a picture of all the characters i play and it's always a mixed bag sometimes yeah you, you need to start we need to start doing uh, just digital galleries so we just take a shot of our uh, and take a picture yeah of that, I, I want the physical artifact i know i know so I, 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 i'm I, there with you school, i get it i get I it i want the physical artifact all right uh next all right question. i'm gonna pause just so you all rock there are so many questions flying by <laughs> we did call it a flood of questions tonight yep. and i know normally we try to limit it to like five so it's good for seo but i don't care let's just keep them rolling <laughs> in but if you could sean just make sure you do copy them into the notes so that when i'm trying to do the podcast show notes i have something to work off i, of I, I, I everything i've asked so far it has Perfect. come out of the notes awesome. um so uh so next up we have another question from tech uh now that you've gotten a few more games off your pile of shame and obligation what is the oldest one there now all right it is a game called shadow lord it was published in 1984 it is the game i have owned the longest and not played it is the oldest game on my pile of shame since 1985 <laughs> and going on and on it is a parker brothers game that uh they advertised very similar to hero quest so I wanted it for Christmas. I got it for Christmas and it disappointed by being one of the heaviest games Parker Brothers ever published, which has forums and forums going, why is this game so confusing? And they just published, like when you got it, there was a telephone number to call that said, this is our most difficult game we published. Here's the phone number for the designer and here's the phone number for Parker Brothers. So if you have any questions while playing, just call is included with the game so yes it is still down there and at some point I, I was thinking about this recently when sean was down i'm like I, and i saw it on the shelf again and i was like there that is the oldest thing on the pile of shame we need to play this at some because how complicated could it be compared to like an 18xx or a gloomhaven right like like there's no way it's that complicated it's just complicated for a parker brothers game right which is, is you know that there's only so complex you can get with that uh so I could be totally wrong and maybe it'll blow us away. It's, it's card driven and the cards are just numbered. There's plastic pieces that you move around the board and you put little ships in them and there's negotiations involved. So yes, could, that, that is my oldest game on the pile of shame. 
so right it, now it could actually get up to mo2 uh, masters of the universe bad <laughs> <laughs> i i don't know maybe i do remember reading the rules and then not playing it and i can't remember if there was like a really good reason for that uh, that may that may have to be a patron stream <laughs> oh it should be we did it with um cats that's true yeah. we did stream cats all right i am gonna look it up see like modern games like stuff uh, otherwise we have i'm drawing a blank well conan's getting is, is up yeah, there but conan's it's not up there. conan's up there um i mean um, ogre doesn't count we don't we don't count that as obligation well, or, or well none of this i'm these aren't obvious. ogres maybe one I, I that was a gift i wouldn't have yeah, bought yeah. that myself i should play it um none of these are by date so no inventory is newer uh vikings i played artist is newer brew crafters the traveling card game in 2014 is up there no burning suns 2013 um no i got that later like it's an older game but i got that later concordia salsa is older than conan which is why okay. i unboxed it I think Concordia Salsa is my oldest. I think like that's why I grabbed it to unbox, but I didn't actually confirm it. No, Duel in the Dark. Duel in the Dark, I got um, at one point, I don't even know how many years ago now. It's a while, a while ago. Like I think Hugo Immune was still open. Two warehouse stores opened at opposite ends of the city. One at the end of Wyandotte, one on Tecumseh and Howard in that plaza that's there. That's this it it was like a fruit market. And then now it's <laughs> um I like exercise, not exercise equipment, but like what's the word like wellness stuff like you, you go there to get wheelchairs and stuff but for a while it was just this it was a grocery store and then it was just this empty building these two warehouses opened up and all of a sudden they had board games and they were um five bucks each or something like that or like four for four for I, I, it was a deal whatever it was if you bought six it was cheaper however it worked out and i picked up i don't know like 32 games or something ridiculous like that most of which weren't so great, but some were really good. Like Steffenfeld's Speakerstat was in there, which is a great game. And um, some of the, the Zavendar games, which I actually enjoyed for a long time. I've, I've now gotten rid of them because I played them enough times. And, and what's funny is these games have been passed around at every white elephant we've had for Windsor Gaming Resource. And they've often shown up in extra life auctions and people recognize them because everyone else also bought these games dirt cheap. So I bought this game called duel in the dark and honestly i put it in extra life auction it didn't sell i was ready to get rid of it until i heard edward from heavy cardboard say it is a fantastic two-player experience and i'm like all right i gotta give it a try before i get rid of it and well i still haven't <laughs> so that is actually the oldest like that i picked up i bought well you know didn't get for christmas when i was eight or whatever um another really old one is i have my dad's copy of empire builder now and he never played it. So I don't know if that counts because that might beat out Shadow Lords because <laughs> that game's been in our family for the longest time without being played. Uh, all right. Um, let me see. I, I don't, well, I mean, for me, it's uh, probably well, you gotta have something. Well, it'd be Scooby Doo is the one that I still yeah. haven't gotten, uh, gotten to the table that we were going to. And then we did the kitchen move around and, and the table got busy. So possibly this weekend that may, that may happen. Uh, depends on. Is that older than Clank? Uh, well, Clank I've played. I don't know. That's not off. Oh, you played Clank. Oh, yeah. I know. No, we played no, Clank a few it? times. Valeria. Valeria. Um, I, well, we got... Or did I give you both at the same time? They might have been both at the same time. Yeah, I think I'm it was sure. both at the same time. Actually, yeah, now that I think back, I think it was both at the same time. Um, yeah, because we, we ended up... The strike team showed up, and, and I knew the boy would be way more interested in that theme-wise. So we got that to the table easily. Um, and then we uh, we we still haven't gotten Valeria and uh, Scooby-Doo yet. Um, we do is cheap in the three for one sale right now. <laughs> go buy three copies. Give it to all your nieces and nephews for Christmas. Well, there you go. All right. Uh, let's see. Ryan asks, uh, what do each of you like to read in novel or graphic novel novel format? What's your favorite genre, subgenre, or series? I can just let Sean take over here. because <laughs> <laughs> Mo reads RPG books and, and then plays yeah, yeah, the, my, plays yeah, the yeah, games. My, my and favorite watches, reading whoosh. material are game manuals. And, 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 he used and to read. Instead of reading, you'll generally watch uh, woo woo movies. Yeah, I, I yeah, I honestly, it's terrible. I don't really read anymore except for rule books. I tried uh, the most recent thing. I'll go with the most recent. Um, generally, I like sci fi fantasy. I, I do not read nonfiction. I read I read fiction of some sort. So that hasn't changed. 
and I used to always swap between the two. I, I would go through like a fantasy phase and I would read a bunch of fantasy stuff. Then I'd get into a sci-fi phase and I'd read a bunch of sci-fi stuff. Now, unlike Sean, I never really got into the hard sci-fi. I was always more into the, the sci-fantasy uh, side of things uh, with Dune being about as scientific as I got. I love Dune. Dune is my favorite book ever written. Um, I used to read that once a year, but I, I just don't read anything now. Um, so I should read that with everything going on. So so I love the Dune books, but I also read trashy Dragonlance novels. So it kind of went all over. Most recently, I finished off one of the Redwall books because I was curious about it. And I enjoyed the Redwall book. And yes, I realize these are for young adults and my daughter loves it. The problem was they gave all the characters accents and they spelled their accents. And I just, I found myself fighting with the book, but I'm like, this is pretty good. And I actually, I, I got it like, I think it was free or a buck or something like we were somewhere and I was like, this looks neat. It's fantasy mice. And I wanted to compare it to mouse guard and it is not, it is totally not mouse guard. It's its own thing, which is neat because it still has a mouse, right? It's that same scale. So I read that most recently. And before that I was working my way through the Dresden files novels, but I fell off the bus at a fourth or fifth book. I don't even know now. And like, I tried to restart that one. It was about demons with coins on their heads. Like I restarted that one three times and I just, I never finished it. Um, and then red shirts. I have, again, I haven't finished it. So what I'm, I guess currently reading is red shirts, which the only time I read is it sits in my van. And whenever I'm bringing my mom or D or one of the kids to an appointment and I have to sit and wait in the car, that's what I read. And I'm in the last chapters of that. And uh, it, for me, it's, it's, I mean, hard sci-fi is, is first and foremost. Um, I, I got my, I mean, I was reading Greg Bear and stuff like that when I was, you know, still in, still in grade school practically. Um, and so I love the good, hard sci-fi with a whole lot of research behind it. Um, Asimov, as problematic as much of his content is now, um, you know, the, the, the science he put into his science fiction always blew me away. Mm -hmm. uh, I had a, there were a few fantasy series over the years that I, that caught my attention. Uh, but most of them tended to drag on and on and on and, and, you know, jump the shark at some point. Um, so I, I, I just ended up stopping bothering with fantasy series because they always went bad. It was just like, yeah. Oh, I know this is going to go in a horrible direction and I may not catch it in time. So ah, done with it. Um, yeah, the fantasy series I read were like the Thieves World novels and right. Discworld, older stuff that actually just kind of just kept coming out with more books. Yeah, well, I mean, it Disc, wasn't like Discworld. The, the... Yeah, Discworld you can't go wrong with. Pratchett, right. you're never going to go wrong with. So, um, yeah, I think most most people who are gamers have some love of Pratchett at least. Yep. I think. Um, and then uh, talking about graphic novels, I finally. I had been a comic collector early in my life, um, actual like collector bag and board type person. And I drifted away from it. It just got to be too expensive a hobby and I, I couldn't keep up. Uh, and then when comics went digital, I kind of avoided it because part of what I liked about comics was reading them uh, and the physical act of holding a comic book and reading it, which is why I still, you know, to this day, PDF RPGs are kind of problematic for me because I'm not holding it. Uh, but I finally, um, actually, thanks to Gail from Twitter, picked up Comixology and got myself a Comixology account and the 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 uh, Amazon tablet I use for reading these days. I don't really read. Uh, most novels are all digital as well now for me. Um, I See, it's put, weird that you were OK to go with digital to novels, but comics still had to stay physical for so long. Size was a big problem, uh, but also the number one reason I went digital with um, with novels was I could read at night without a nightlight. Mm. Um, I could read in like because I never had a Kindle paperweight or anything like the Kindle book Kindles that needed a light. I could read in bed without turning a light on um, and bugging anyone, uh, and that's why that's actually why I, I transitioned to reading because at bedtime reading is when I generally read. Right. Uh, I read and then I, I drop my tablet and fall asleep. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I, I picked up a, a big collection of Red Sonia from Gail Simone that was on a big discount. And she's like, look, look, hey, everyone go check out all my Red, Red Sonia stuff. It's like 80% off for everything I ever wrote in Red Sonia. So I'm like, oh, you know what? Darn it, I'm going to do it. I've never really read Red Sonia and Gail's awesome. So let's go do it. So I picked that up. 
Uh, and then right now, what I'm actually working on is the third archive of uh, of Savage Dragon, which is a fictional superhero created by Eric Lar- uh, Eric Larson, um, which is a really fun comic book supers universe. Uh, and I'm I'm finding myself picking little tiny bits of of inspiration from that universe mm-hmm. for some of the stuff I'm running, and and I've, so I'm enjoying that. And yeah, I just started on the third um, book a set of those uh, those comics. Yeah, graphic novel wise, all about mouse guard, but that comes out so infrequently. Like it's not like you keep it up. But if a new mouse guard book comes out, I get it. I love mouse guard. Uh, before that would have been Ultimate Marvel when the, the Ultimate Universe launched with Ultimate Spider-Man. I actually own all the Ultimate Spider-Man except for the last two books. I was really into the Ultimate Universe when it launched. I really loved the new view of the Marvel Universe and the recreation of the heroes I knew and loved that managed to keep them still being the heroes they were but told new stories, which the MCU has now proven they can do it again. But at the time, that was pretty groundbreaking. Uh, other than that, I don't I, I did collect all of the Star Wars um, when I actually had a job in the auto industry. My pull at Rogues Gallery Comics was anything that said Star Wars on the cover <laughs> because the relaunch of Star Wars with, I think it was Marvel, whoever got the license with the the, the prequels, no, the what, what do you, postquels, whatever, the <laughs> latest ones, the three, the three ones that ended so flipping horribly. Uh, but when those launched, those comics were amazing. The Darth Vader comics in particular introduced a bunch of characters like Dr. Aphra and a couple of bots that are the best droids that have ever been produced in Star Wars. Yes, even beats out um, the one from Rebels. Um, Dr. Aphra is one of the best new characters they've introduced, like up there with Cad Bane. That series was fantastic. The Poe Dameron series was great too, because Poe's such a great character. And they basically redid the um, Rogue Squadron stories because Poe had his own squadron. So it's kind of like Luke and Wedge and his squadron, but told in a more modern way. That one was really good. And I literally got all like I got there was a C3PO one, there was a Han Solo one, and all that. Those comics were so good. And they were official and licensed by um, Lucasfilm. So they were all canon. So you didn't have to worry about any of that. And a lot of the books told you backstories for scenes that were in the movies. I, I devoured those until I couldn't afford it because getting everything with Star Wars on it obviously wasn't cheap. At the top, we had the spare money for it. So that was the last thing I actually got into. But like I said, uh, no, way better than HK-47. Meatbag. <laughs> HK is good, but he's not as good as BT and Triple Zero. So they are fantastic. Uh, speaking of sci-fi, if anyone has read... Uh, any of the novels from the Bobiverse? Um, Not one I know. Let me know. I, I'm dabbling at it, but then I almost went ahead and, and, and grabbed them for the Kindle. And then uh, the reviews on Amazon didn't look as good as the reviews that kind of pushed me towards it. Uh, so I so I hesitated and didn't pull the trigger. Um, also, for some reason, I, I don't understand licensing book rights. If I go to Amazon.com, they have the entire Bobiverse trilogy in one Kindle archive. Mm-hmm. But in Canada, I have to buy them all individually for like an extra, you know, 15 bucks or something like that. Because you can't buy Amazon.com Kindle books for Canada. Right. We, oh. we, we found that one out. And you also can't. Way. Well, the other problem is you can't buy Kindle books for somebody else. Yeah. Yeah. Um, which is yeah, it has to be on your Amazon account. painful. Like, like I know I wanted to get my daughter an Amazon Deanna account and start buying candle. her own, buying her books. Yeah. And I, I can't, has she has to be on candle. our account and. Oh. Yeah. You know what I would like to read that I keep hearing great things about is the honor verse. So. I, okay. I, I love them. We'll yeah, like jump said, in. I've, Go I've for heard it. From so many people. And I want to read the expanse having now seen the series. I want, I want to read the expanse. So uh, you need to, uh, when it comes to Honorverse, there is a point you can just stop. Yeah. (laughs) Um, Because they kept going, and it turned from a really great space armada. um, Oh, yeah, that was the... the It was was the, 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 you know, this galactic level battle and a lot of strategy and tactics and and really interesting. But then the last two books, they may have been more Mm -hmm. after that, uh, it went into politics. She essentially got promoted out of Which the Navy. Of fits. And it, it fits like the arc. Wise, yeah. It fits the arc, but it got to be really boring. Like it was yeah, just, sure. I think the last book I never finished because there was nothing that brought me to the series left mm-hmm. in the novel. 
and that was a disappointment but i think you've got like but i think literally that's like book 14 yeah <laughs> like it's there's a lot to read like, there. like honestly i should just read the dang books i have downstairs oh I, I think i have three william gibson novels i've never even cracked the cracked open which i did i grabbed red 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 uh oh red shirts which isn't Gibson, but I grabbed red shirts and I'm like, I am going to put this in the van and that way all the time. So I'm going to read those. So that was good. Sanderson, isn't he the one that did um, Dying Earth? Math Guy Dave's going on and on about Brandon Sanderson. Yeah, I don't know. But apparently uh, the problem with Brandon is if you're older than him, don't start because the number of books he has planned and the number of years left to write them could be probably fantasy and science fiction i'm trying to find the name of his series cosmere mistborn okay I've, I've at least heard of mistborn i know the name never read anything by him it's not the author i was thinking it was oh he did wheel of time oh, okay and d's talking d's talking about i only want dead trees all the dead well, trees listed as the wheel of time yeah, Brian he Sanderson finished the series. Wheel of Time series. Oh, he finished it? There you go. He's co-author of the final three novels. I'm like, I don't know. I'm, I'm like, Wheel of Time? That was like <laughs> Robert Jordan or something. Right? Yeah, Robert Jordan. See, I never read any of those either. Yeah, I. you, you know what? It, the reading in bed thing is what pushed me out of Dead Trees for novels. Yeah. See, that and was... also not like bookshelf space at a certain point. Yeah. Like I've got all these old uh, sci-fi novels that were good, but aren't aren't, no, aren't of the kind that I might read again. Like there are certain mm -hmm. authors which I will pick up again, like Dune. I just finished reading. I've just literally finished devouring every piece of Dune media available uh, as a lead up to the new book. But a lot of them are like, yeah, I'm, I'm never going to read that again. <laughs> yeah. See, the problem is uh, the sleep machine thing stops the fall asleep to the Kindle problem. Mm. So just because of that. Fair. Okay. So yeah, reading fair. reading to fall asleep doesn't actually work. Uh, uh, all right. So moving on, uh, what have we got here? We got Mountain Papa. What's, or, what's a movie or book not already used that would be a cool theme? I'm assuming for a game is yeah. what you're talking about. Usually I have an answer for this, but I'm drawing a blank right now. So for me, it is uh, Ian M. Banks. Uh, and I think I've even talked about this on the show before, though. But the culture series of books from unfortunately deceased British author Ian M. Banks would make a fantastic game universe. Um, it is a post-scarcity uh, you know, uh, world or uh, you know collection of people mm -hmm. uh where ais have basically taken over doing all the work and people can do whatever the heck they want uh and if they want to go do something dangerous they can back up their brain to the ai you know to to their local ai and go do something dangerous and if they happen to die that's fine they just get mm -hmm. you know regenerated or whatever but there are other um collections of beings out there um and the the AIs take humans along sort of as as extra bits <laughs> to go along. And it's you know, there's some great comedy involved. Uh the naming of ships, if you ever read the books, is a fantastic aspect of the um the ships name themselves and they all have personalities mm -hmm. and things. And it's just you mentioned that one. Before, yeah, the, yeah, the the universe is so ripe for the picking. Uh unfortunately, however, uh with him being deceased, who knows what the rights of getting something like that right. could be at this time. Yeah, I'm still everything I can think of has now come out as, and better versions. I, I can think of worlds that could use better games, but I can't think of anything just off the top of my head. Um, I always thought Visionaries would be an amazing RPG, <laughs> but I don't know, even know if anyone who knows what those are anymore. Uh, oh, what's uh, Amethyst? Remember the comic book series Amethyst? I remember it existing. That's uh, about it. It was probably directed more at D, which means she may not have actually considered it because it was aimed more at her. Yeah. Uh, my sister was a big fan of Amethyst. That could be an interesting. Um, I know she used to read Promethea. Yeah. We'll talk about that one. It was too pink. Yeah, there we go. That, that was D, D avoided it like the play. But no, uh, yeah. So if anyone wants to take a look, the Amethyst comic book series could be an intriguing uh, you know, thing to take up. Yeah, I, I'm sure there's something, but I am I'm drawing a blank. Like everything I can think of, they've done. Like Dresden Files, that board game's terrible. 
I would love a good Dresden Files board game, but there is one. So I, it technically doesn't fit, right? Like, like what, what, what's something that, that would be a good theme that was not already used? I'm, I'm drawing a blank. Like I used to be able to say G.I. Joe or Transformers, but even those are done now. Yep, they're coming out. Like, and, and, I, like, and I've said for years I wanted a good Master of the Universe game, though I want a role-playing game, which hasn't happened yet. Well, I believe it is, though. It's yeah, just a matter I'm of time. I'm not sure, probably. No, no, it'll it only is. be in the in Japan and you can't ship to the EU <laughs> or the US. No, I, to... I'm pretty sure IDW has <laughs> masters or not IDW. IDW doesn't do games. Not, not IDW. Um yeah. whoever's whoever's Renegade. doing G.I. Joe and Transformers Renegade. also Renegade, Renegade I believe also has the the masters. Yeah. IDW, that must be where Renegade got the licenses. I bet you they got them off. Oh, probably. Running Man board game. There you go. Ryan's got a good one there. I would oh, play that. Okay, but... That's a good call. Is it going to be the book or the movie? Because those are two very different I, I don't know. The the theme of people trying to escape yeah. in a game show, but it would have to be, you know, you're the runners trying to get to the end, not the meta. I would think just the actual Running Man as presented. Uh, I mean, I would do a Running Man RPG in a second, but that would be the book, not the movie, not the movie for certain. Because yeah, I would I'm, I'm do all the meta levels. Death Race 2000, tech, I'd say that, but it was Thunder Road, right? Like that, literally, they even have the helicopters. Yeah. Thunder Road, the original Thunder Road by Milton Bradley is the Death Race 2000 board game. So yeah. You don't have points for hitting old people. That's about it. So yes, a redone Death Race 2000 game, which would not be able to come out in 2021. No, no. With, with points for running over babies and stuff. I mean, you would probably even struggle with Running Man, uh, depending yeah. on how you did it. I mean, as long as you as long as you made it, um, you know, as the the correctly, I suppose you could, but that would take a, a some type yeah. of walking probably. And yes, Restoration is doing Thunder Road. Um, it's looking good. It's now the problem that's scaring me is lots of expansions. Like they're they're trying to Fireball Alley it or fire, what is it? Fireball Alley, Big Mountain Island, thing? Island. Island, Fireball, fireball Island. Island. Fireball Alley sounds like it was a thing. I mean, Fireball Island, like when they put that out, they put it out in this extra boat and the ship and spiders and whatever. It looks like they're doing that. Um, actually, to be honest, uh, Rizul, Courtney's saying Kung Fu Hustle. I don't know how you'd capture the comedy, but I have yet to see a good Wuja board game. Like that really feels like a Wuja movie. I have not seen anything come even close. Like here, put out a Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon that looks good, right? Like, like, actually plays like crouching tiger and lets you pull off that stuff in a board game and honestly i have no idea how i, I don't know how you do it i don't know if you're using like uh, the elevation discs of the old dragonlands board game or something like like what what's your mechanic for being able to run on bullets to kick someone in the face right like in an rpg that works and there yeah. is a great rpg out there for that but for board game so oh. Ryan's Ryan's asking about a blade board game, and while no, I'm willing to bet in the next five years we will see it because reboot Blade is being rebooted I, into the I MCU. Thought there was a, I thought there was a blade board. Oh, game. possibly, but he's being rebooted into the MCU, yeah. which means for certain there will be blade board games. Oh, um, this is a good topic. <laughs> I, I just Spiral Zone, but that goes again way way back. Um, I I, I want to. I'm insulting people we've reviewed games for, but I want a good Robotech game still. Like, like, I don't know what, but not, not what I played. Some are decent games, but none of them really feel like I'm playing Robotech. I'm Macross Robotech there. Well, because the Invid Invasions is, there's enough there. Yeah. I, I do feel like I'm, I'm taking part in that universe in that game, but I want a good Macross game. And well, you, it's, and you want something that's heavy. Like you don't yeah, want, I want heavier, you, that's right? The thing, I, right? I want, I want something a little bit more to it. Um, The cell I'm pretty sure exists. There's what is it, room 42. I think it's the name of the game. Mm. if you look it up and it's all about being trapped in various rooms and stuff um gattaca game uh, Gattaca's a great movie but yeah, yeah i don't know what i'd do with it in a board game yeah Probably i don't know i'm sure thing. they're i'm sure they're they're trying to be a hidden well, hidden trader try to get by it'd almost be like the um they've made a game of the rutger howard scene from blade runner and to me that's kind of what gattaca would be right like well they be, just today announced a uh, blade runner rpg I thought um, there, again there was one from an older publisher so it's probably an update uh so the op Razul has asked the opposite of ryan's question what board game would make a great movie or series i want to watch galaxy trucker the movie i want to see tv i want it to be a live action i want to i want a fake reality tv show that is galaxy trucker the board game 
where you have competing teams trying to assemble their ships and then flying them through space with all the meteors and everything and seeing what team makes it to the end and one team blows up halfway through. It could be a movie that's just like one extended episode, but I would totally, I'd watch a series of that. Fair, that that's fair. what I want. Uh, I, I don't know. I would be tempted to watch. It would almost have to be anime, but um, com- unfair, the anime series where you get competing nice. yes. uh, competing theme parks and they're literally like backstabbing each other and sabotaging each other's rides and things. And, See, again, and... I picture as a reality show where they like show Sean off to the side where stuff's in the back. Well, yeah, they just put up that observation platform. But you know what? I got a big wad of cash in my pocket and that's not going to last long. Wait till the after the commercial break for this one, you know. Like that's yeah, how I picture. but I mean, I can see that. But I, I could, all, but I could see it being done in anime where you could yeah. actually get away with, you know, killing people and not, you know, being arrested. Yeah. <laughs> so, that. um, you know, stuff the, fables is a good call. Okay. Yeah. That that is a good call. Yeah. There, here's here's a, a geek shame. I've never seen Cowboy Bebop. I thought Any you finally did. No, it was on Tubi and they pulled it. So oh, I never actually got okay. to actually watch it on TV. See, it's interesting. You're not the first person like this week who is like, oh, I just watched Cowboy Bebop for the first or started watching Cowboy Bebop yeah. for the first time. And I'm like, what? In, in 2021, why is this coming up? I don't even because understand. Because you can't find it. Maybe it's on something. Now. Yeah, maybe, maybe it's come out on something else. again recently. Now, there is the movie on Netflix, but at base, that's newer, right? So I'm assuming mm. I'd be better to watch the original series uh, before yeah. watching Watch what it. you can. <laughs> yeah, it's available. Uh, um yeah i've heard it's good wasteland delivery service i guess but that's just basically i don't know it's borderlands but animated so yeah i guess a borderlands animated movie would be cool yeah um oh i thought of one that i want to see a board game of pacific rim oh where's my pacific rim board game talk to talk to jen she'll be in she'll be uh (laughs) she'll be all over that oh Um, man if you haven't watched pacific rim black on netflix yet do it it is so good. I have not. So no, uh, that's that's the new animated series. Okay. Warning, it doesn't end, but supposedly a new season's coming. It okay. is really good. That makes me think Pacific Rim would be a fantastic role playing game. I, in that well, particular Jen, setting, the, like, oh, Jen's half play. already kind of yeah. like <laughs> developed it and just wants someone to pay her. Um, but yes. Oh, there is a. I don't remember a Pacific Rim. I know games that simulate Pacific. Yeah, you can Rim. you can play Pacific Rim in certain games, but it's not. There is no Pacific Rim game that I recall. Oh, but there, 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 I thought of a movie series, well, franchise, because there's now, what, two, two or three movies? I can't even remember now. Three movies in an animated series? Did they get to the third movie yet? I don't even remember. So that's what, I, I can't even remember. That's, that's, see, I'm I not a huge fan. The two, it just, I just I finished know. watching Black, and I'm just thinking about, but like, it's got to be produced like giant killer robots, GKR right. heavy hitters, which is a $180 game, but comes with pre painted mechs. Like, it's got a, with a giant kaiju, it's got to look good. It's, it's got to be like on the level of that. Well, I mean, I, you I, essentially, Simon has to do it if you're doing a board game. Well, no, giant uh, killer robots wasn't Simon. There no. are, there, there's so many people with Kickstarter now doing miniature games. I think almost anyone could do it. No, but I'm thinking like uh, Death May Die Cthulhu size kaiju. <laughs> well, no, no, not well. Hey, maybe as a final boss, yes, yes, you could have one. Okay, fair enough. That that might require Simon. <laughs> it might. Um... Final Fantasy minis game. Uh, yeah, there's there's no reason they haven't. I, I, it has to be a whole whole right. licensing thing. You don't say there are Final Fantasy games out there, but the Final Fantasy Tactics is out. It's um. Whoa, what's it called? It's one of the Tiny Epic games. Tiny Epic Tactics? It, it's not licensed, but that's what it is. And you use the box and stuff to be able to play it. All right. Uh, well, we'll we'll jump into something a little uh, lighter for a second. Uh, Rizul okay. asked, if Bellhop could be a promo in a game, what game would that be? I, I don't know. Not one I thought of before. At least I thought he was asking what kind of promo would it be? Like, what would your card power be? And I'm like, oh, now we're getting into the whole I'm Gloomhaven thing again. <laughs> um, uh, um, I don't know. What game would I want to be in? Kind of thing. Go Cuckoo. Giant Meeple. You sit on top. No. <laughs> that would be awesome. Actually, now I want it. I want, like, Mo cross-legged like this. <laughs> put on top of the Go Cuckoo thing. <laughs> oh, Okay. <laughs> I'm trying to think of something we play all the time, and I'm like, I'm like, do you say an unfair, unfair? Yeah, an unfair, unfair promo, promo card, card could be fair. I, I don't know what, just the bellhop, and then like it'd be a, like an employee, 
I don't sure. know. That could work. I could see that. Well, there you go, Dan. I had this <laughs> there idea. We go. She's, she's yeah, pitching it behind your back. How do podcasters end up being promo cards? Do the people reach out to the podcasters? Do the podcasters reach out to them? Or do they like reach out to an artist like Quan Chai Moria and go, can you draw a picture of me? And then they <laughs> provide, like, how does that relationship happen? I'm, I'm assuming it's probably a late night at Origins at the right place yeah. kind of thing, but I don't know for sure. That would be my be- that would be my guess, right? Like that's my guess is the the certain types of gatherings that happen, the gathering of friends type of stuff. There there are multiples of those, and I've been to some of them, and most of them are just crowds of people trying to get free stuff. But the people who stay after the giveaways tend to make some interesting connections, right. which is why we got a pile of stuff from Queen Games one year because I got to meet Trevor, hang out with Trevor for a while from Queen Games, and that worked out well. Um, dead, no, I don't want to. I hate Dead of Winter, so no, I do not want to be in Dead of Winter. I'm trying to think of like games I'd like. I'd want to be a miniature in something, maybe. I don't know. I'm like I, I'd say Terraforming Mars, but there's reasons I don't really want to be involved with Terraforming Mars anymore. Yeah. Like that's my first thought is a Terraforming Mars promo card that I don't know what it would be. The bellhop who collects game cubes, and then you get two points for every game cube the bellhop's collected by the end of the game or something. And I don't know, there'd be another card that would be like um, uh, the Jones theory makes the bellhop discard cubes because cubes replace cube or something. Right. But, but again, well, we gotta, we gotta get the bellhops laws into a game. And so, there you go. Um, and I need more interesting laws then instead of just get the <laughs> game played. Um, I said, I'm trying to think of yeah, something with a space played. hotel. There we go. There's the Grand Austria Hotel. I should be, a, I've never even played the game, but Grand Austria Hotel would probably be a, an appropriate one. Uh, all right. Uh, look, so. Quad uh, heroes, I'm up for that. There you go, quad heroes. Okay, yeah, I'd be yeah. like, I'd look like a square bell, obviously, <laughs> with like the beard somehow. Right, and then the Q would be the the dinger. Uh, that totally could be a thing. Gloomhaven's a bit. No one gets to be promos in Gloomhaven. No, and I, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not strange enough looking and weird. Have you seen <laughs> the stuff from Frosthaven? The races. Wow, I yeah. love the fact it's not Tolkien. I, I love still it. have to figure out. Like they just dropped something today. They made an announcement in their Discord about blah 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 blah, and I have no idea what it is they announced. I guess <laughs> I'm not in the Discord. It's so, so weird. So I gotta. I, I mean, I haven't had that game installed in ages, but I think I need. Oh, to, you're talking about the Gloom Yeah, the, the the video yeah. game. Um, so I think I need to reinstall it and figure out what the heck they're talking about. Me, something, something has happened. Something's been released. Something's been added. I oh, yeah. don't know what. Um, I just I got bored of the fact that I it was just kind of a roguelike with some of the character classes from the game, but mm-hmm. not all of them. Yeah, it 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 failed for me and I lost interest. Clank. I'd be a promo and I'd totally be a promo in Clank. Um, isn't everyone already a promo in Clank? Yeah, most people <laughs> that's, that's but but I'm trying to think of games I like really like or core worlds. Like give me make me a leader in core worlds. That'd be even more badass. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying to think of games I'm like I'm like I don't know, Space Base, how do you do a promo? The Mo ship, like uh, the <laughs> Bellhop ship, that doesn't really work, right? I'm um, like, Quacks of Quillenburg, and I'm like, well, I'll be an ingredient? Like, like I'm just trying to think, like, what kind of games have promos? Uh, um, the, this, uh, Sentinels. wasn't it? Sentinels. Um, Sentinels of the Multiverse? Yeah, I, I already am a card. I played him. Did that not look like me on that card? <laughs> yeah. He was a terrible character. Actually, people tell me he's great, but not... Do not make a deck yeah. with two defenders and a healer. Yeah, no, that was that uh, actually ruins the game. That was that was a horrible mistake on our part. Yeah, uh, <laughs> I, I just feel bad because it ruined the game for Sean even to get into experience <laughs> it really. Um, I think it was 2019. I uh, think it for was Fro- for Frosthaven. I'm just trying to get to the end of the end of the updates right now. I wish there was a show all on updates. So I, you yeah, didn't I have to hit load like, more every it's, time. Like, just show me the day it ended. That should be there. Well, and it is. And now, but you got to scroll no, down. Like it should be right at the top where it says, blah, blah, blah. People made this a reality. Raising this much money should say on this date. And then it. Here it is. May date. 1st, 2020. 2020. Okay. That so was the fun. That was the funded day. It wasn't day. that long ago. Yeah. May 1st, 2020. Um, all right. Uh, moving and on. No, we did not back Frosthaven because we're not even halfway through Gloomhaven. <laughs> all right. Moving on to the next question. Uh, from Tech. Uh, to, to, to Sean and Mo, what is the one thing, or game related or not, that is coming out or that you have ordered that you're excited to get your hands on? Oh, you got anything? Uh, well, I mean, that's I've got so much Kickstarter stuff anymore because <laughs> nothing's been coming. 
Um, yeah. So I think I am still really interested in getting my hands on Galaxies in Peril, um, which is now, I mean, March 2021 was the expected date. Yeah, you were expecting to get that and run it. Yeah, I was hoping to be, have been running that this summer, um, and uh, that still not happened. Um, he's getting closer. He's, he's, you know, he's keeping us updated, but he has already, he's at the point now where he's already started working on his next Kickstarter. Um, yeah. it's like, you know, everything is just kind of stuck in places and there's nothing more mm-hmm. he can do. So yeah, it's too bad. That's, uh, that's unfortunate. Um, the next one, uh, I do believe my studies in sorcery game is en route. So within two to three weeks, I should have studies in sorcery. And I am looking forward to getting that to the table because I know that that has shipped apparently. So, all right. My biggest one is the PC I ordered two years ago. Please, sometime, anytime. You were there when we yep. talked to Wayne yep. and basically he's refusing to do it because it would cost too much. But like, I'm at that point where I'm just like, I, I thought you said hero queer and that sounds amazing. There should be, that should be a thing. We, we could we could get together with some miniature makers and we'll make rainbow dice but yes pc i i don't i want to be downstairs I, this shouldn't be happening in this room anymore it should be happening downstairs i shouldn't be adjusting cameras so you see miniatures so you don't see these office i shouldn't have to rearrange all these lights and everything before recording um not even the video card i just i want the full pc um added to the fact you can't get video cards anymore you can no longer get power supplies anymore so without scavenging from an old system and you can't get power supplies that are good enough to power the video cards because everyone's using them for data mining sorry we're explicit for a second <laughs> we'll ding that out yeah make a note to ding out at uh whatever it is yep so yeah pc that has been ordered at a want the most um second i'm looking forward to coyote and crow showing up um i am looking forward to going to game cons next year probably breakout in march hopefully that'll be a big one um i know this isn't the one thing the one thing is the pc like like there's more to it than that there, there's family related reasons that we could probably free up this room which would be very good for my teenage daughter who is sharing a room with her younger sister right now in a bunk bed she doesn't fit in. right um so we we want to get out of this room and move everything downstairs like Deanna's office will be down well Deanna's talked about also possibly moving upstairs but whatever rearrange the whole house basically but to do that I need a better PC and yes what I could do and we've been talking about it is move this one down there but we just had the damn modem put in right here which really sucks because they didn't ask me where I wanted it they just did it we might have done that somewhere else that might have been more centrally located but yeah that's that's the biggest one um gaming related I I coyote and crow i want to see show up i want to look through that i want to flip through that book uh board game wise i'd like kickstarter i do have a hero quest coming and supposedly according to hasbro it's going to make it here by the end of the year and well it is hasbro so there's a chance yeah because they can pull strings that other companies can't uh so that might show up especially now that i we did do exactly what i thought they'd do and give us all the stretch goals so i'm even more excited about because there is more newer content and it's not just going to be the same game so i'm looking forward to that um the new azul uh as for want to try i really want to try the new azul it's cool you're like drafting parts of your board as well as hexes to put on it and uh, you know how much we've enjoyed all the other versions of azul so i am looking forward to checking that out and the new unfair expansion and land and sea which is the latest game from good games publishing also looks really good and i hope that's on its way but i can't actually confirm that because i filled out a form and i haven't heard from them since so hopefully they'll just magically show up I don't know. I'm like I'm thinking I might need to reach out to the people who are like, you are the best review writers out there and say, you know, hey, I filled out the form. Can you, you know, give a little push there or something? Uh so uh Matthew and Dave has a question just for me. Uh Sean, how many RPGs have you bought in the last two months? <laughs> uh and, and actually that's it's kind of hard to figure out. Um there's backed, there's bought, there's uh there's supplements. Uh, for actual RPGs, it's probably only about seven, uh, <laughs> ish. Uh, if, if you said over the last four months, it would be significantly higher because there were some binges in there. But uh, there were some binges. <laughs> it's uh, it's probably about seven full RPGs. <laughs> this That's sounds like an answer for your accountant. Uh, 
Oh, wow. Uh, and then uh, I think we're probably coming to about the time we want to wrap this up. We got one more question here from the lobby I see, uh, and that is from Razul. What is the next con you see yourself actually attending? Uh, probably breakout. Like I, I that's it, it's like the first one of the year anyway, right? So Toronto by March. Heck, I don't even know. Well, I like, mean, I, I honestly don't know. We should be. With the vaccines and everything, we should be going to cons in Toronto. At least there's no border crossing. Well, and the other thing is now, uh, as of today, actually, Ontario yes. has uh, started a mandatory. Um, you have to you have to display proof of vaccination to get into places. Yes. Um, and so, because that's starting today, uh, and then a month from now we move to a digital passport. Right now, it's actually a physical piece of paper. So you um, can bring up your yeah you can bring it up on your phone but they, it up on your phone. they will move to i don't a, understand what everyone's like here's a, there's a professional laminating company in windsor that will laminate. i'm like stop fucking profiteering all you have to go to i forget the site but you go to this one site and it brings it up and you just have to go like this yeah i i i there's a whole lot of ways to fake it as well though so uh, i'm looking forward to october 22nd when the digital uh passport comes out hopefully it won't be broken um and and they'll actually be more useful because honestly um it's it's pretty sketchy the way they're doing it right now it's really easy to just do whatever yep um but because they're doing that now forward six months from there hopefully ontario is in a much much better place hopefully. and the con can actually happen whether or not we'll be able to enjoy that time with all of our friends from buffalo and, and other areas who come up to that con that's a whole other question, but yeah. uh, hopefully Breakout Con will happen. Hopefully Breakout, and unless there's something closer, because I just, one of my goals is to go to more cons, to, to network more and to get our name out more. So like maybe there's something in London, Ontario, we'll I'll find out about. Um, we've been invited to one in Michigan, but, but you still can't cross the border here. Uh, the U.S. doesn't want us in, which I still find laughable when you look at the numbers <laughs> on both sides. I'm like, kind of like, oh, who are you kidding? Yeah. Um, even with the Mexican excuse, I'm still kind of like, what, who are you kidding? But yeah. sure, whatever. So so that's why a lot of people are like, why didn't you go to Oregon? Why didn't you go? I can't. I, I, you can't. And yeah. it's ridiculous to fly somewhere I can drive to in three hours or five hours. If I can drive there in three to five hours, I'm not going to drive four hours to Toronto just to take a flight to get there. Yeah. And then there's the whole, we may not get let back in and quarantining and all the other BS that goes with it. So that wasn't going to happen this year. Because people are like, I can't believe you're not here. Like I have publishers like that wanted to have, hook up and I'm like, no, <laughs> I'm like, even if I wanted to. Yeah. No, Indian, Indianapolis was not a good place to be. No. Uh, their numbers were horrible. And the, I, I don't feel Gen Con did a suitable, uh, took suitable steps. Protect I mean, the people. to protect the people They yes, yes. Based on Indianapolis's, uh, regulations, they went over and above, but Indianapolis is in a really bad way right now. So maybe they're not the best thing to be paying attention yeah. to. I'm, but, I'm still wondering if there will be fallout from that. Yeah. And well, for people who attended and did take precautions, I hope you're fine. Yep. Yeah. Like we missed like I, in the last little while, Deanna lost two grandparents and we can't, that's, it was in the States grandparents live in kentucky and we couldn't do anything right we couldn't see anyone we couldn't cross we couldn't so yeah no going to cons if we can't even go to funerals right yep so that's why it's way too low a note do we have a do we have a like happy question to bring that back we're like <laughs> uh so what are we at? Uh, went to gen con I've got and something here across the borders uh see something about uh, d thinks i could be a good guild master promo i guess <laughs> Uh, I know. I just I just deleted. We had some backup question. I deleted. Oh, you deleted that. I'm like, where did this? Where did it go? I'm like, it yeah. is here. I could um, probably undo. There you go. Oh, we should do this. We definitely should do this before we go. All right. It's so like, it was yeah. time sensitive. So one of our uh, we have one other question from one of our patrons from Pax Paxinarian, uh, and this is a time sensitive question. Their spouse has been asked to pitch a tabletop related article to an editor. They suggested travel games. Now that we're traveling more, a lot of folks are probably pitching the same old decks of cards in their carry-on bags. What are some great, compact, portable, flexible venue games that folks should consider packing? 
All right. So when I got this question, except for the time sensitive part, I totally wouldn't answer this tonight. This would be a full episode that the, the travel games is a full episode. And to be honest, I have two other questions in the queue about traveling with games, but I've been holding off on them due to, as we just talked about travel being restricted. So I didn't want to bridge those topics, but what we'll do since this is time sensitive and we love packs, we will do some stuff off the top of our head. So one of the first things that came to mind was Zentico because to me that's a camping game but it's an outdoor game but the way that wraps up easily fit in your luggage it's PU leather and plastic great three-player abstract game just don't play with two with two it just it's you could play forever you need at least three players to play it so Zentico was the first thing I thought of uh the next thing I thought of was my personal copy of Travel Catan which unfortunately I don't know if you can get anymore but it was all self-contained and only about this big and it's perfect it fits on a plane table or a train table perfectly and it's little tiny plastic pegs unfortunately it's not magnetic but in general if anything gets jostled it's fine and it has like the smallest cards i've ever seen they're like only this big for all the resources but they're trays to hold all of it so like everything's contained now if you get a good bump from the bottom you've lost your game because they're just kind of pegged in but it has drawers to hold four different players components and no it's it, it even does the full katan like it's not even like the family version each of the hexes are all there what's already set on the board of the numbers so you shuffle up all of the um if you shuffle up all of the tiles face down you then just put them over the numbers which can lead to bad setups as far as distribution but it does have set setups so that's actually um, the, the pocket Catan, I think is fantastic. Um, next would be oddball aeronauts, or if you happen to be traveling where you don't have a table, because this is a card game you play in your palm of your hand. You each have your own deck, you hold it in your hand, and it has to do with flipping up three cards and putting cards when you're defeated to the bottom of your deck. It uses a rock, paper, scissors style thing where you're picking an attack type, the opponent picks a defending type, and like cannons beat out another one. Really simple, but it's the fact you don't need the table. With that is a game called Palm Island. This one just comes recommended from other people. Um, note, I don't have notes here. I don't know how I'm <laughs> pulling off. Just going here. Palm Island is another. It's you play it in the palm of your hand. I, that's all I know about the game. Is it, It's basically whenever I talk about Oddball Aeronauts, everyone else is like, no, 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 pick up Palm Island. So Palm Island. Then there's all the two-player games we love, all the ones, all of our coffee shop table games, uh, the the Duke. Um the B1 hive. hive. Yes, I'm like the B1 Hive. Um, not patchwork, unfortunately, unless you have large tables. Yeah, no patchwork. Or you want to do it with stacked. You can kind of do it with stacked polyominoes and you just put them in the box. It's a mess. Yeah. I, unfortunately, it takes up too much room, but now there is Patchwork Express, which is smaller. Again, I can't tell you. Uh, I haven't played it. Supposedly, well, Patrick, and, you know, ro uh, rolling Western. rights are another great option. Like yes. any of the rail, the rail uh, games and, and those railroad you know, ink, railroad ink. Um, what what about uh, Seven Wonders Dice? Um, I've seven... never played Seven Wonders Dice. Isn't there a Seven Wonders? I, I'm, I'm I'm not crazy, right? There is a Seven Wonders Dice. I don't dice. remember there being a Seven Wonders. I thought there dice. was now. That doesn't mean there isn't one. Lanterns, dice, uh, silver and gold. Um, uh, oh so clever twice as clever no nope, we haven't reviewed all of these um super pinball starcade lantern dice i i agree it, it does take up a bit more room than some of these other ones roll for lasers there's an interesting one where you can just print it out before you go print out a couple sheets and bring a pencil and some dice uh to bring up something we reviewed a long time ago um the other thing, though, I'm trying to think of like stuff that fits in your pocket. Uh, card games, Star Realms, Star Realms. A Star Realm deck is like a deck of 60 cards. You could easily throw that in a pocket. The um, Button Shy Games produces a whole ton of games that fit in a mint tin. Um, and I couldn't even name a bunch of them have mint in the name, but then they moved on from there. The Tiny Epic Games are tiny and epic. Um... The other thing, too, is you want light games you can possibly play with other people. Uh, again, thinking not pandemic, but if you're <laughs> killing time at a uh, airport and you can see another couple at a, at a table and be like, hey, do you want to learn a quick game? Stuff like No Thanks for Sale, uh, Farkle, the nice, quick, easy games. Uh, Seven Wonders Duel actually is surprisingly small in the box, but the footprints... Yeah, it takes up some space on the it, table. It depends. Like, like Deanna and I, like we could play that at every coffee shop in Windsor, but the second cup, 
because they have the stupid round tables. But every other coffee shop we could fit it. But there's no room for your drinks. Like it just it, it it's close. Um, uh, Go Cuckoo has a metal container, so I don't recommend carrying that one around. Yeah. Uh, unless you're unless you're driving everywhere, driving everywhere fine. But if you're flying anywhere, don't bring Go Cuckoo. Yeah. Plus, uh, unfortunately, that tin gets easily dented, so you don't actually want to throw it in your luggage unless it's just with light clothing. Um, which is a disappointment actually on that one. If I walk downstairs, I, I, I'm sure I would see more. Um, the one with the cards that you layer, Circle the Wagons, Kaido, um, uh, Lotus. Uh, if you got a big group, you could bring Gorus Maximus. Yep, absolutely. Uh, Medium is a surprisingly small card box if you're looking for party games. And technically, Medium, you could just like pick a few of the decks and shrink it down to... You could probably fit it in a standard deck of 52 cards if you just like took out the cards you needed. Uh, I went, you know what? We talked not too long ago about the L deck. Uh, <laughs> how many different games are there for the L deck? Yeah, uh, though I, we never did actually try any of them. Well, our whole list of uh, free print and plays probably had a ton of them. Our free games that you could play with D6 Dice actually had a ton of print and rights, like print and roll and rights, right. including some like interesting dungeon crawls. Um, there, there's so many i'm just now i'm drawing a blank but uh lost cities the original lost cities can take up especially if you get rid of the board and just use the the cards do not Did you pick mention up bananagrams bananagrams is good jabuka jabuka be perfect um a little wordy does not take up a lot of room there's tons like yeah. honestly there are tons tons of great great travel games uh what I, if i was going to write an article for the general public I'd be sticking to the the bananagrams, the the little wordy. Maybe mention the mint games, like the button shy games. But the problem with those are is you want games people can go to their corner store, not corner store, but like like a big box store and buy because they're not going to know what a local game store is, right? They're not going to know to go to a Hugen and Munin. But I know that's long non store at this point, but they're not going to know to go there to pick up. Like like who's going to get you a copy of Adrival Aramans? Yes, it was the first thing popped in my head. But who's going to know where to pick? I don't even know where to get a copy of that now. Is it even on Amazon? Right. Bean, Bonanza is a good one. Bean you used to be able to get at Walmart and stuff. I don't know if that's still true. Uh, that's kind of why I mentioned Catan right away. Yeah, button shy games. Are, like it's said, wallet games. <laughs> no, I would love to see it. the Happy Salmon played on a plane. That doesn't quite work when you got to swap. Codenames? Uh, Codenames takes up a lot of room. Codenames, hey, I would two love phones to see... and play at codenames.game. I would, I would, yeah, I would love to see a, a travel edition of Code Names. There's no reason you smaller. can't do it because yeah. it's like that box is not a travel box at all, um, and it, it seems really excessive how much space that game takes up. Yeah, yeah, Code Names is unfortunately not. Uh, Flux, I hate so no Sushi Go. <laughs> that's a lot of cards to pass. But I don't know that that depends on room. Yeah, I don't know how it plays two player. Teach is a good game. That's fair. Pretty much any, you know, macaron, any trick-taking game, right? Diamonds, hearts, spades, you can get the, the modern ones. You don't want, like, an arboretum where you're building a big tableau of trees. Um, Deanna, I'm just scrolling back through the chat, see what they said for people listening at home. Uh, Deanna, again, men mentioned our free print in place. There was a whole bunch. Lantern dice, patchwork is mentioned as a table hog. Friday, that's a good call if you're traveling alone. Um, though, again, I just say get the app. Owner rim. Owner rim can be played two players. Or actually, all of the Oniverse games. Travel uh, Quirkle should just replace standard Quirkle. Uh, hey, if you want to play Takedo, the app does pass and play. Yep. Great interface. We love that. Oh, someone else mentioned Jabuka. That's a good one. Quix, that's another roll dice. I don't know Enchanted Plumes. I've, of course. Onitama repackaged, I guess. Onitama again. I just played on a phone. Travel Quirkle came up again. The mint tins, it's been mentioned. Uh, definitely, yes, for enchanted plumes. It's, yeah, that, as long as you got a, a table that, you know, that you can play, uh, play a game of solitaire on, yeah. you can play enchanted plumes. Uh, Las Vegas is a lot of little dice. That's the only problem I worry about that with traveling, bringing all those little dice, but they're these sexes. Strike could be fun, but again, you got dice possibly flying everywhere. You don't want to play strike and have someone on a plane and have some, you know, die go flying into another chair. What they need is uh to, to stop something like that you need essentially a uh a boggle type thing but soundproofed yeah. so because no one wants to play boggle on a plane you would annoy every other human being on that plane crack, yes. crack, crack. but if you could get like a sound a, a sound muffled 
boggle yeah. container so that you could play some of these dice games without having to worry about dice flying everywhere. That mm -hmm. would be fantastic. Why do we, I, I think I, I need to copyright or like patent this concept quickly before someone else gets it. Cause I've never seen anything like it. No, I haven't. I wouldn't work with strike strike is you have to throw the dice. It's a oh, dexterity okay. game where you're, you're literally, you, you throw dice into a bowl and you're trying to hit the other dice to roll them to certain sides and stuff. Right. That's we, we, we need a copy of strike. <laughs> I've yet to get to play it. It went out of print for a while. It came back. They came up with an HP version, but it's had silly symbols. And now there's another edition of it out where they're actually calling it gladiators or something. Cause there was a gladiator theme at one point and, I don't know. They keep switching it. It's I, it's one of my I need to play it lists. There, uh, Courtney has a friend that's working on a sound free dice tower, so okay, you set the hook go. up and then yeah, yeah, yeah. you know make make an equal you know fifty fifty split <laughs> deal. I, there's more. I know there are more. Like we could probably give thirty of these games. As for the best, I'm not really ranking them. <laughs> you know, on on what's great. And what's well, it not. depends. It depends so much on you know. Are you traveling by plane? Are you traveling by car? Are you looking for something you can play in the car while you're driving, or yeah. in the plane, or just something you get that. there? Just you know, just something you can play when you get to a location. Are you looking at playing you know with groups or with just you and a partner? Or there's so many variables in, involved here. All right, I don't know if Pax is still around. We might have <laughs> we might have uh, answered it after. They left the chat, unfortunately. Is that other madly uh, uh, scrambling notes? Taking notes, yes. <laughs> we we probably should have hit that one earlier. I, I you know what I I deleted it thinking because I had it as a backup question, but it wasn't meant as a backup question. I had it in the backup section, right? But it wasn't meant as a backup. I question. think yeah, I was I was getting ready to go for it, and then all of a sudden it was gone. I'm like, wait, wait, it's Which time me, sensitive. I am going to quickly jump over to our, uh, our our Discord and see if anyone else put anything in before I continue. All right, no, uh, that was Razzle's mentioning travel sequence is a good one, and Pax is there. We didn't. Uh, yeah, there we go. I was we like, didn't. oh, I feel bad. <laughs> I'm like, wait, we were supposed to read that one. It's just I put it in a certain spot where we usually have our backup questions if no one asks anything. But you all were awesome today, so we didn't have that problem. So I almost <laughs> forgot about it. Um, but no, no, there's nothing else in our Discord, so we are good to move on. All right, well, that's it for today's. AMA. Thank you so much for the questions and awesome interactions. We've made a note of any questions we didn't get to tonight. We'll save those up to potentially talk about in a future show. Sounds good. Remember, you don't have to wait for an AMA to ask us questions. If you've got a game or game night question for us, just head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. Welcome to a spoiler-free look at the Wrath expansion for the fantasy deck-building game Draconis Invasion. Thanks, Jeff Lai, designer of the game, for sending us copies of the base game and this expansion to check out. No other compensation was provided. Now, Draconis Invasion Wrath was designed by Jeff Lai and features artwork from Manthos Lapis, which is the pair who brought us the original game. So that's always a good thing to see. They didn't bring anyone new on. You got the same design team working on this game. Now, this expansion can be played from one to six players. And the hard part here is games could take 15 minutes up to two hours, depending on your player count. So that's a rough one. It's very dependent on the players and what cards are in play. Some rounds are going to be lightning fast. Others are going to be much longer. Now, a copy of Draconis Invasion, the original box set, is required to use this expansion. And you probably want to own all the promo cards for the game as well. But much more about that later. Now, Wrath successfully kickstarted in 2018 by Keji Inc., and backers have received their copies. So all the reviews and everything on Board Game Geek right now are all based on kickstarted versions of the games, all the ratings and everything. The production version is still not in stores. It's not available in retail due to current logistical issues that are going on. Now, at this point, the only place you can actually find this game is for pre-order directly from the publisher, and he is currently selling it for an MSRP of $47 Canadian. Now, I'll say straight up, this expansion and the base game itself are on the expensive side, mm -hmm. but we are in a world of increasing costs. And unfortunately, this may become more of a standard pricing for games of this size. Now, I will add that right now, both the base game, the expansion, and all the promos are on sale as part of the pre-order sale on the Draconis website. Now might be the perfect time to order this game if it sounds cool. I don't know how long that'll last, and I don't know what the prices will be once it hits retail. 
Now, as for what Wrath is, so this continues the story from Draconis Invasion, which was this invading army trying to capture your kingdom. The story continues in this expansion box, spilling outside of the city, is all I'll say. It includes over 400 new cards for the game, covering every single card type from the game, including actions, defenders, invaders, campaigns, events, dividers, and even some special cards that have very limited use. Now, these cards are split over 13 sealed packs that can be played through in order to form a continuing campaign. If you want to check out what you get in the box and how it's packaged, be sure to check out our Draconis Invasion Wrath unboxing video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. Due to the fact that this is a campaign style expansion with sealed decks and we didn't want to spoil anything, Mo is careful not to show off any hidden information in that video. And to be honest, I'm not sure how interesting an unboxing it really is when I'm not actually showing off the cards, but I really didn't want to spoil anything. Yeah, in hindsight, deck 13 probably could have been yes. uh, part of that, but we didn't or know. Open up deck one because everyone's going to see deck one the first time they play. Right. It's probably what I should have done, but I didn't want to do it at the time. Now, what you do get is it comes in a, a, a standard card size box, like trading card size, like go buy a box of baseball cards, size card box. Uh, the 13 sealed packs are Tetris in there in a rather interesting way due to the various card sizes used in this game. Uh, if you just check out my original view, you would have seen the, the square cards and the half cards that are in there. While it may not be pretty, it worked. Uh, everything was nicely, tightly packed. Nothing was sliding around, and I had no concern that anything would be damaged. Now, the cards themselves are of excellent quality, which is obviously true of the base game. These are honestly some of the best deck building cards I've played with. They have a linen finish with them. They're nice and thick. They're a joy to shuffle. Uh, one of the things I noticed playing this, which was true of the original game, but I didn't catch it, is there's no borders. And I don't know anyone who's played Magic for a long time, but you know the borders wear on your cards. Well, the art is full bleed, which I thought was a nice touch. And speaking of the artwork, I am very pleased to say that much of the artwork, not all, but much of the artwork is brighter and more colorful than that in the base game. Though I do still feel like they should have upped the brightness a bit more. And I do wonder if it's that whole screen versus printer issue. It just could have been a little bit brighter. Yeah. And one thing I will say is about the quality of these cards. Uh, it is a major reason why the price isn't as bad as it is. Uh, you aren't getting linen finish cards that will shuffle this and hold up this well when you buy Magic. Um, these are a step above in the quality of each individual card. And not only do they last better, but they just feel better shuffling. They do. Like, like they just do. The tactile nature of those cards is really nice. And you don't have the slippery piles that want to fall over. That that I hate when I get that in games. But yes, the regarding the art, the market is finally no longer a wash of a single color across mm -hmm. the entire field. You get pops of color and intensity that make certain cards stand out that in a way that we never really noticed in the base game, except for one card, the Sorceress, that we talked about several times. Everything was that blue and gray. Nothing except the Sorceress, nothing except the sorceress is, is sticks in our head because yeah. that was the colorful card, right? That's, that's the reason we remember that card is because that artwork stood out so much. Now, one issue we did notice, uh, and to be honest, it took a few plays before we noticed it, just to show how not obvious it is, is the card backs are not a perfect match for the original. They are really dang close, but not quite there. Now, I know right there, that's going to be a deal breaker for some card game players. There are card game players who insist that your expansions must look identical to the original. Uh, honestly, we didn't find it to be a problem at all, uh, especially once you mix in these 400 new cards. Like, there's a 50-50 chance it's going to be a new or old card, so it's not like knowing that's a new card is going to give you much of an advantage. Uh, but there are going to be some people turned off by that, and of course, the other fix is to get um, card backs, right? Like sleeves that have some you know your favorite artwork on the back of it then you'll never have to worry about that uh what was interesting is uh in our set we actually noticed an even larger difference in one of the monsters for the base game yeah changing from within the base game so again it's this may not be a huge concern because it's not as as easy a divide as new cards and old cards yes. uh, even within the print run there are some slight variances there yeah, and it wasn't just the monsters. I think Kat noticed some that weren't monster cards, that were original cards that were just like a little bit darker or whatever. And to be honest, there's so many cards going around, you're shuffling so much. Like, you're unless you're playing for money, who cares? 
Now, in addition to these sealed packs, um, there is a little bit more in the box. There is a two-sided sheet that tells you how to use the contents of the box, which also includes the updated version 1.1 rule. So just in case you're one of the few people out there that has version one of Draconis Invasion and haven't gone online to download the new rules, those are included in here, along with reference cards that show the new A, B, C, D, E, F system. That was actually something new in the second printing. And then there is the best piece ever, the cloth bag which we now know is actually for holding these square cards once you take them out of the package. Though I honestly don't know why you just wouldn't use the cloth bag in the original Draconis to hold all the square cards. Personally, I appreciate another nice large bag I can use in another game. Now, as for the amount of stuff you get, the quality of the stuff, I was impressed by the, the volume of this box and the quality of it. Well, now that we have a vague idea of what comes in this expansion box, how about you give us an overview of how to use the Wrath expansion for Draconis Invasion? So let me start by saying nothing really changes as far as the rules are concerned. The basic rules, the A, B, or C, or D, or E, then F, all the same. You continue to play the game. You even continue to set up the game the same way you always had, just by adding some new cards, and maybe a couple rule twists, like a little unique, like uh, stack the deck differently or put out a slightly different number of things or put out different action cards, which I think is fantastic for people who enjoyed the original game. To use Wrath, when you first open it up, is really simple. Find all the packs with stickers on them with a number one on them. I think there's three. Open them up, read the scenario card for a bit of a backstory, flip it over, and it'll give you setup instructions, set it up and play. Yeah, and hopefully, as well as the uh, the market layout, they, any minor play or setup changes per scenario are right there on that card, uh, on that reference card for each scenario mm -hmm. pack. So by the end of it, you'll end up have 12 little cards that both give you the, the market layout and any rule variations or yes. setup variations right there in those 12 cards. So now the first pack does contain the most new cards out of any of the future packs. And it gives you new events, actions, defenders, more. Like there's a lot of stuff in this first one, including new, new um, what are they called? The bad guys, I'm drawing a blank on what they call Invaders, thank you. Invaders is more. Now you play through that scenario, right? You read the card, you got the setup, you set it up, you play. Two players, six players, doesn't matter. You finish it, you play pack number two. Rinse and repeat for 12 more packs. The 13th pack, because I did say there's 13 packs here, doesn't have any new rules in it. What it is is all the dividers for the cards in the expansion. And while the game says save this to the end, it might spoil it. Just open it. Like, it's just a bunch of names and artwork. It doesn't tell you what these cards do or what their need abilities is or how the rules change. All you're getting spoiled on is a name and artwork. So I personally recommend open that first, because then when you're playing, you can put your cards away as you're playing. Yeah, if you don't open this pack 13, you're probably going to hate yourself when you have to go through and organize new cards into the main box later, unless mm -hmm. you keep them all separate forever. Um, and But they provide randomizers for all these cards, so I don't know why you would keep them separate. Uh, realistically, you're because these cards are coming and going throughout mm -hmm. the games, so they, they'll come in for a couple scenarios, come back out again, uh, you're going to want to have these all nice and organized. So yeah. just get those dividers in. Like, honestly, like what, what, what does it matter if you know there is a sorceress that tells you nothing, yeah. you know, there's a sorceress. Great. And then here's the artwork for it. <laughs> now, one thing I think you should do, and, and I recommend this to everyone in something that, that it's not in the rules. This isn't an official suggestion. This is a tabletop bellhop suggestion from, I think all five people who have played the game with me is don't open the next pack until you actually win. So when you finish a game of Draconis Invasion, there's two ways to win. One is one of the players kills a set number of the invaders. And in that case, the heroes have won, right? You defeated the invaders. The other way is for the event deck to run out when your forces retreat. Now, retreating to me means you should lose. And if you finish on a retreat, but then unlock the new scenario, it just doesn't make sense, right? It doesn't make sense thematically. Plus, when you're reading the story, it's not going to make any sense because the story is all about you won, you had a victory, and you did something because of this victory. Well, you're like, well, I didn't have a victory. We all retreated. What's going on? And the other thing is it will also greatly increase the challenge. And again, I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a couple specific missions 
where having the special rules for that missions and then making it so you have to not retreat would make those missions much more interesting. Yeah, and I don't recall if we said this in our initial review explicitly, but so. this should be a basic feature of the game. If the retreat card is revealed, no one wins, the game wins, however you want to phrase it, you should not advance and pick a winner. Yeah, the, like I said, the way the game is, you retreat, but you still add up victory points and someone still wins. And then the team in this campaign still progresses, which is it's just a disconnect with, a, again, the theme and the mechanics. Now, once you do complete Scenario 12, all of the new cards will have been added to your copy of Draconis Invasion. As Sean mentioned earlier, there's randomizers for all the new attackers and defenders. Uh, and you can continue to play, mixing and matching the cards as you see fit. Including, or perhaps except, for a couple of cards that there's no way to play with again. Yeah, unless you make up your own rules for them. Again, I'm trying to avoid spoilers, but there, there's kind of a neat thing they do, but it just doesn't really lead anywhere. Yep. Now, again, uh, I don't want to spoil anything, so I'm just going to say each of these packs, each like pack 1 through 12, changes and adds to the game in some way. Now, most of these just give you new cards to buy or new monsters to defeat. Like, you're not changing any of the other decks. You're not adding new events. You're just, here's new stuff you can buy. Here's new things to beat um there are or sorry new new actions too right so you have actions and defenders there's decks that just give you actions and defenders sometimes you get new monsters some cause significant changes to the feel of the game but again the mechanics don't change you're still doing a b c d e f um the terror still rolls up the same you still start with a d6 roll to see what goes for like none of that changes. mechanically it's the same it's just kind of the feel of the game now, really high-level overview. The changes you're going to see are single-use cards that you play it and it's trash. So that's something new that was in the original game. Completely new starting defenders. And what's cool about this is this gives everyone completely different starting decks. Not from each other. Now, that would be cool. There's something we should try is mix and match them so every player starts with different defenders. That's not in the game. So, so different starting defenders for all players. Uh, new powerful invaders. Um... They include some interesting combos that make them easier to defeat with certain combos. Uh, new defenders that defeat invaders in new ways. That's all I'll say. Um, after battle effects that involve more player interaction. So not just take a terror or take a terror on your deck or draw only three cards. That's all that was in the original game. Now you're going to be passing cards to other players, collecting terror from new places. Everyone's going to get something. Added to that are events that are going to reward the players with the least kills instead of punishing those with the most. That is greatly appreciated. And of course, more. Okay, so lots of new cards doing new things. How well does this all work together? Should Draconis fans be rushing to pick this expansion up? All right, so this had to get in here somewhere, and I wasn't sure exactly where to put this in this review, but I think this is the best place to put it. So before I go any further, I have to bring up a serious problem with this expansion that can, will, and should be a complete turnoff for some game players. When you get to scenario five of Wrath of Draconis Invasion, the game requires you to own certain exclusive promo cards in order to be able to set up the scenario and play through it. Now, these promo cards were included as part of the last Draconis Invasion Kickstarter, but are not included in the retail version of Draconis Invasion, which is the version I was sent to review. Due to this, we get to chapter five. We're one third of the way through, right? We beat four out of 12. So we're one th third of the box. We still have two thirds to go and we're stopped. We're done. There is no way for us to progress forward by the rules as written. By what is presented in this box, we're dead in the water. So I was playing with Sean at the time, and I think Deanna had joined us at this point. I think that's right when she joined us, was, was right at that point. And we discussed options. So like, do we just stop? Like, like, do I then go on the Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast and just say, don't buy this because you can only play one third of it? Or do we play through just skipping those cards, right? Like, so your market is no longer six attackers, six defenders. Do, I, like, I didn't even know. I was so frustrated when I saw this. Like, like we... I, I, I was shocked. And to be fair, I mean, we spent an inordinate amount of time. Uh, I'd been managing the cards ever since we ever since we first broke out the original Draconis. Um, I had just been the one who had organized the the box and, mm -hmm. and laid out everything and alphabetized all the dividers. And I, I thought I had made a horrible mistake. Yeah. I, I was sure that 
you know, I, I had done it right. And I, I somehow I had mixed up something or when I'd been adding some of the first four sets of, of dividers and things, I'd, I'd made a mistake and mixed myself up. And, and I mean, we probably spent half an hour at least trying to find out where these cards are that yeah. it was telling us to put on the table. Yeah. Like I even went and grabbed my original Draconis book. Cause I'm like, maybe these aren't promo cards. Cause like we went through there. Cause you have a card that tells you everything that was new in each pack. So we went through one through four and like, Nope, those cards aren't here. Then I grabbed my original book and there's a whole section at the back where it lists every card and it repeats the card text, which we had a comment on <laughs> in our other review. And I'm like, they're not there. Nowhere was anything in any of the Draconis stuff I own mentioning any of these cards. So publishers don't publish an expansion for a game that requires the use of promos. That's, that's unforgivable. Like, what are you doing? And if you're going to do that, put a big sticker on the box. that tells me that before I open it up. Yeah, this uh, eventually we thought to go online and look to see who else had noted this problem. And sure enough, there was a thread on board game geek where the designer acknowledges the problem and there offers up the list of substitutions. Right. Uh, and we learned also in that thread that it isn't just that one uh, uh, scenario, but three different scenarios yeah. that require promo cards. Uh, and to be fair, and to be to note, there are actually two separate packs of promo cards. Did we ever figure out you, if you it's needed both one. of them? It's only one. I mentioned it down below when we get to the end, but yeah, it's only one set of promo cards that you can now purchase that you would need. Oh, okay. It is not both. So. Well, I'm glad that it was addressed, right? Jeff, Jeff knows it's an issue, and he addressed it on Board Game Geek, but it needs to be addressed in this box somehow. Like, we're experienced gamers, right? We're, I, I hate to use the term, we're alpha gamers, right? We, have, we do a board game podcast every week, and twice a week, and, and we're constantly talking board games, and we're on Board Game Geek regularly, and I've been a member since, like, 2002, and I know to check there when we find problems like this, but your average gamer who buys a copy of this cool looking card game with a dragon on the cover and then the small expansion box or goes online and buys it. I have no idea where to look when they run into a problem like this, like without something included in the box, this expansion is almost two thirds unplayable as a campaign. So I will note one of the things that didn't even click into my head at the time when I was getting frustrated by this is it is just the campaign that's ruined. So the box does have a bit more value than I was thinking. Like I'm originally thinking, throw it out. I can't finish it. You know what? You still got 400 new cards. So there's nothing from stopping you from just opening up all the card packs, putting them in your game and forgetting the whole scenario thing. So fair enough. It doesn't invalidate the rest of the box, but you can't continue the campaign without this additional information. Yeah. So fair warning. Uh, if you pick up the Wrath expansion for Draconis Invasion and you don't have the Kickstarter edition, with the promos, and you are willing to buy them direct from the publisher, you're going to need to go on Board Game Geek and find the substitution list to complete the campaign as written. Yes. All right, putting that aside, let's ignore that major problem. Let's assume that uh, before the retail versions get to the box, they manage to slip a sheet in the shrink wrap with everyone or something, or they put a QR code to Board Game Geek or something. Let's assume this gets fixed some way, or you at least know it's a problem, so there's a way way to find it out. So let's, let's tossing that out. Just looking at Wrath or Draconis on its own. Oh, wait, ha quality. Quality was great. Like, like, I'm happy with it. I have no complaints. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the differences in card backs is subtle enough. You have to go looking for it. And everything else is as good or better quality than the original game. I appreciate the amount of color and variety in new artwork, though we did have to question some of the names that were used for some of the cards. Uh, if you do have it, just take a look at the Goblin Enforcer card for an example of something that just doesn't quite fit. The biggest, toughest, most humanoid goblin i have ever run across anywhere i still assume it's a little tiny goblin in a suit that's the only way that card makes sense to me there we go and that's in my head canon that's what it is it's a labyrinth thing uh the new card abilities excuse me the new card abilities cover quite a range with a focus on player interaction managing terror and cycling your deck these are the big things they added to draconis with it and what I thought was neat is they actually kind of grouped these abilities when they were revealed. So you would start a scenario and you would get a bunch of new cards that all kind of do the, the same thing, right? Like a bunch of new cards for cycling your deck or a bunch of new cards that do stuff with terror. 
Along with this, I really like the fact they gave us new basic defenders. We already kind of hinted at this. So about every three packs or so, you actually replace the basic card that everyone starts with with something new. And I thought that was fun, and I liked how much it changed up the feel of the game. Though I have to admit, there was one new basic defender that none of us who played liked, and it's one I may never put in a game. But I do dig that the variety is there. Yeah, it's interesting. It, this one particular mechanic was enough of a change in play style when it came up that it did not sit well with our own uh, our own style of playing. Now, yeah. I won't go to say, go for, so far as to say it's a bad card concept, but uh, we struggled to make it work in our group. Yes, I agree. So. Now, a very welcome addition that was nice and early in the box, and this was actually one of my main complaints about the base game, was the lack of variety in event cards and how every event card targeted the leader. I am very happy they mixed this up quite a bit. Though I do still kind of wonder why they put so many copies of each individual event. Indeed, the maximum number of events in a six, is in a six-player game, uh, and you can have 18 event cards drawn. And mm -hmm. yet there are significantly oh, yeah. more cards than that. Uh, and at five players, we only ever went through all 15 once. Yeah, the only thing I can think of is they were trying to, maybe there's some waiting being done so that certain events happen more often than others. It, it just seemed odd to have that many. It just felt like you could have cut the deck in half by removing one copy of every card. Now, this expansion has a number of new invaders. Uh, these are the things you're fighting in both blue and gold levels. And I appreciate the new variety. Now, a twist I didn't expect is there are new unique invaders. Because in the previous game, all the event invaders there were multiple copies of, right? So there are new ones that are totally unique. Like there's only one copy of it in the entire deck. And they don't have corresponding campaign cards, which I thought was an interesting design choice. And I'm pretty sure it's intentional. The one effect this did have was to curb the rather powerful strategy of just hoarding campaign cards. In the original game, anytime you had nothing else to do, you grab two random cards, just hoping you get a lucky match. Or later, when you can kill something, you've already got the card for it, right? With this new card balance, campaign cards are still important. They're still an important part of the game. But it's much more likely players are going to pick and choose now. And I think that fits the game better. Indeed, I think campaign cards are no longer the way to win every time, which in the original game, they really were. Uh, if you, you know, you had to match your campaign cards with your kills or the person who did was going to win. Yes. Yeah. If one person was doing it, everyone had to. That's what I found in the original. You could play a game where everyone kind of ignored them and it would work. But as soon as one player started collecting them and you knew they're, you know, they're laying out their cards in a certain way, you're like, oh, they got a through few they've fulfilled there. You basically had to start going that route. Now, with all these new cards and scenarios, I, I think this is going to be true of any expansion with this many cards in it. I will say that some were much more fun than others. There were a couple of scenarios that took steps to speed up the game that I honestly felt did not work at all with two players. But then that exact same scenario limitation worked great with five players. And then there was a mix of defenders that made playing five players a real slog. Yeah, I, I can certainly see how once complete, uh, I would consider seeding the randomizers mm -hmm. depending on the player count so that, oh, wait, if we're going to be playing with five players, we do not want to risk having these guys in there. Yeah. We'll take those out and we'll randomize from the remaining. And that's something I would love to see with from the publisher. Just give me a list of recommended cards per player count would be a nice one. Like this card works great at two players. This one works great at six. Um, if I play this game a bunch more times, I'll be really tempted to like throw in a sheet of paper where I make notes like that. Now, the weakest part of the campaign, not the gameplay, but the actual campaign is the story. Well, I appreciate an ongoing story that evolves as you play. That's something we called out that was kind of missing in the original. The story is not written very well. And then the mechanics of the scenarios didn't tie in well to the story all that often. Yes, some of the card names kind of match what was going on, but like the abilities didn't seem to match. And it's like, here's a thing where we're all supposed to work together and then all of the new cards are take that cards. It just didn't really make sense to me. Just like they didn't, they should have been woven together better. And I needed an editor who didn't like commas nearly so much. Um, I particularly hated the end of the story, which I don't want to spoil, but there's a certain trope in fantasy gaming and fantasy writing that most writers nowadays know to avoid. Uh, whoever wrote the story didn't get that memo. 
Now, it's certainly better than just having titles for the scenarios as in the base game. Mm. There is more effort put into it, but it could have definitely used a bit of refinement. Now, I was also really bummed out that we didn't get anything. We didn't unlock anything. There was no reward. There was no, no, you, we played through 12 scenarios of Draconis Invasion. We beat the Draconis. We finished and it was just done. Like, like there was nothing. I, I would have liked something new to add to the game at the end. Like I, Pack 12 didn't even have to be a scenario. Pack 12 could have been our reward and I would have been happier. The stuff actually to make sense based on some of the cards that were in there that would have been a good reward actually now that i think about it but like i would have loved to see something like i i would love six unique cards that you shuffle between players at the start of the game and give me a bit of asymmetry or a set of recommended card combinations like we were just talking about when going forward if you play two player try this if you play this try this or if you enjoyed playing this scenario perhaps try this or i don't know um, some really powerful action card that you can actually only buy if you've completed the campaign. So it rewards players who've completed it versus those that haven't. I, I don't know. I don't know what exactly, but I wanted something. Like, to be honest, there's not even a, a denouement. There's no finish to the story. It, it leads you up to the final battle, but there's no uh, congratulations, you won. Like, even a card that said those words would be more than what we got. Indeed. Uh, something I didn't want to explain the resolution and potentially line up further expansions would have given a level of satisfaction that was absolutely missing yeah. after putting in that time to play through the entire tale. Yeah. Slip something in the, the, the pack 13. You didn't want us to open it to the end. The, they're taller cards. You could have easily slid in some short cards. We didn't know were in there. I don't know. I just wanted more. Now, one thing we all felt, this, this is for all five players that I played the game with over the, the, the last weekend, was it's just so close to awesome. Like, it's a solid game. We, we had fun playing it, right? We must have. We played 12 games over one weekend, and we're not completely sick of it. I'm talking about Draconis, thinking about we earlier, we were doing an AMA, and people were asking us, what games do you want to show off? This is one. I want to bring this out to the local game store and try it with six players. I want to get my deck building friends, the, my, my, my friend Charles, who loves Dominion. I want him to try this game and see what he can do with it, because he'll come up with card combos. He'll, he'll find a way to use those two cards that we kind of alluded to earlier in an amazing way, right? So, like, it's, it's a good game. It keeps drawing us back in. We weren't sick of this when we're done. But we just kept spotting little things, just, just little tiny things that were just so close, like just a little bit better. Uh, for one, naming the characters that match the artwork and the abilities. So like if you've got a flaming sword, have it do something like use terror to do damage because it's a flaming sword. Or have the ice sword do some kind of freezing effect and not let me search my deck for some reason I don't understand. Or like any of them, I'm, I'm mentioning cards from both sets, sorry. I guess there's some very slight spoilers here. Um, just have cards that, that make sense more. Like the, the Goblin Enforcer we talked about, make it look like a goblin or they can show the little guy in the suit. Um, someone in the chat pointed out they think it's someone who enforces goblins, but then have a picture of a goblin being whipped on the card or something. I don't know. Um, card costs seemed arbitrary and sometimes seemed way too high or way too low. Um, there were cards we never bought in the entire 12 match. Every time that card was up, it was just like, that's a card no one buys. And there were other cards that would go out, run out first. Every player, as soon as they could, would buy those cards until that deck's out. And, and the story elements weren't cohesive. There was a whole thing where we're like, we're, we're running, and then we're under siege, and now we're running again. Just lots of little tiny things just, just could have been improved, just with a little bit more work that just would have made this game from, yeah, I want to play it again. So I, I already dig it to, oh, this game's amazing. Go check it out. Yeah. Like in the base game, I don't recall um, other than one specific card. I don't remember any other cards though. When it was brought out, when it was in the market that everyone went for it, you know, yeah. if, if you had the money, you bought that card. Yes. Um, whereas in the news, in the, in the expansion, there are a number of cards that were, you know, I mean, oh, yeah. if, especially in the larger groups, if you weren't paying attention, you missed out. That card yeah. went away um, and you could get some really incredible combos. Mm -hmm. um, we were doing like full deck cycling and, yes. and like full deck cycling and a half, you know, all, you know, almost to the point where we were running through the deck twice. 
um it, with some of these combos and that was that was exciting that was fun and yet every once in a while there'd be a card where you're like oh that card's in this game again great mm -hmm. so overall uh we had fun playing through wrath for draconis invasion uh draconis is already a very solid fantasy deck building game and in almost all ways wrath builds on and improves that experience well, I didn't love every new card, and I found many of the scenarios were more fun than others. I enjoyed playing through this campaign and discovering the new aspects of play that changed the feel of Draconis Invasion without changing the game, without changing the rules or mechanics. You're still doing the same things, but it felt unique and different. While there are some things I wish were improved, things that could make this expansion even better, it's still really solid. That is except for the one major huge problem of having scenarios that require you to own cards that were released as promotional items. While you can find a substitution list for this problem on BoardGameGeek and now also on our blog, and you know what, I'll just mention it later tonight, you shouldn't need to go outside this box to use it. I seriously hope Jeff and Keji can find some way to, to get this in the box somehow whether it's a QR code to download something some way before this hits retail, like this entire system could crash and burn because of this one problem. Even just a little card or slip of paper shoved in the box to let people know what those substitutions are. Yeah. Otherwise people are going to try end up playing with five or four card market lines. And that's not really going to work. Uh, I, you know, in the chat room, somebody mentioned, you know, oh, well, they can just, you know, send out the promo packs to the retailers <laughs> to include with. Well, those are $40 promo packs. Yeah. Uh, they aren't going to give those away free. <laughs> now, maybe here's another suggestion. They can send out the three specific cards that are affected instead of the entire promo pack. I don't know, like I'm thinking of I've seen publishers do this, so I know it can be done is it's work. You have to unshrink wrap all your games, but you include something inside the shrink or a sticker. Just a sticker that says, no, this. Yeah. That way you're not having to reproduce, reprint the entire game. I don't know. I just hope, for Jeff's sake, you can figure out something for this. All right. If you own Draconis Invasion and you backed the Kickstarter and you got all the promos that came out for it, just pick up Rat. Like, like there's honestly no reason not to um, go pre-order it right now from their website. For someone that has everything, this expansion is just going to give you more of what you already dig, and they're going to give you new combinations of way to play. Like, I honestly can't see any reason for someone who already has this stuff and enjoys the game, even a little bit, to not pick this up. Yeah, I though I sort of expect that if you are this person, you probably went already went in on the original Kickstarter for Wrath and may already have it in your hands. Yeah, though, if you back the first edition in 2015, you may not have backed the other because you already had the original or not. So for those of you who are out there, now, if you do own Draconis Invasion, but don't have the promo materials, whether you back the original Kickstarter, you managed to get a retail copy, or you back the most recent Kickstarter and just didn't get the add-ons or anything, and you're reading this, I do suggest you pick up, sorry, reading, listening to this, I do suggest you pick up Wrath. Um, since you've listened tonight, you know about the promo card issue, right? And you know where to find a fix. I'm, you know what? I'll give you the list by the end of this episode. And you can find it on our blog. You can find it on Board Game Geek. Overall, Wrath made Draconis better. So to me, if you enjoy the game, this is a must-have. Get the substitution list, use it. It's not perfect. I would have rather had the promo cards, but it works. Yeah, and while we did find that you can buy the promo cards, their cost on top of what is arguably already a pricey game and expansion was a bit of a sticker shock yeah it is not cheap the thing is it's not just the three cards it's other promos it's they've combined promos from two different kickstarters you do get a significant number of cards now if you have played draconis invasion right you went to a local game store event you demoed it at gen con or origins back when it came out and you like it well enough but we're kind of on the fence you didn't love it but it was neat wrath might just improve the game enough for you to get it to the table more often or to want to actually pick up a copy and play it. Like if your complaints from trying that original game like mine resolved mainly around lack of variety, especially with the events, why were there only three events and why are there only three different types of invaders, right? This may just make that game, the game that you want to play and hits the table. 
Yeah. Well, so it, however, it is a bit of an expensive purchase again for those who are unsure. Yeah. Hopefully, with local gaming events come up, you can do a demo of it again. Maybe doing a demo of Wrath would be great. Now, if you've not played Draconis Invasion and you're thinking of picking up both games, because people do that, right? They buy the game and the expansion at once. I don't blame you. Like, to me, that's probably, that's how I got it. I got both together. This could be a solid choice, especially if you can find some kind of bundle deal that's got a sale. I don't know of one of those currently, but just as, as a point out. But be aware, the retail second edition of Draconis Invasion, which is the one about to hit stores, does not include these promo cards. So you are going to run into that problem. You are going to have to do the substitutions or again, go try to find a way to get these promo cards. So do watch out as they are currently between retail releases. As yeah. we mentioned, you can pre-order on their website. And I went for a look today and prices on the secondary market are dumb. Uh, Plus, currently for the version one version of the game. If you want, uh, if you want what we have, um, actually, sorry, better than what we have. So it's the, if you want the, 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 uh, base game with the promo and wrath, uh, I was seeing that going for almost $200 us. Uh, so that, that's someone selling their Kickstarter versions. So yeah. Wait for the retail. I think you're just going to have to wait for the retail. Now I mentioned this already. One thing I wanted to do before we sign off for tonight to save anyone from having to go to board game geek, not that there's anything wrong with board game geek, but trying to find the thread isn't easy. You got to go find the game and go through the forums and try to find it where Jeff points out the substitutions. I think we'll just list them here. I don't see any reason not to do this. Now I've also put this list on the written version of the review over on the blog. So you can find it there. And you know what? I'll throw it in the show notes too. That way you've got a permanent record of it somewhere. So this is pretty simple. These substitutions are required for scenarios five, nine, and 10. You are going to substitute Dragon Hunter with Dragon Slayer. So Dragon Hunter is the card it calls for. Dragon Slayer is the card you will have from the base game. You're going to substitute Soul Frame, Flame, Soul Flame with reinforcements. And you're going to substitute Call to Arms with Courage. Yeah. So that's it for our review of the Wrath expansion for Draconis Invasion, which should be hitting retail soon. I invite you to ch also check out Mo's written review over on, uh, uh, of this expansion over on the blog at tabletopbellhop.com. You can find it under reviews or use the search bar in the sidebar. And now the Bellhop's Tabletop, where we look back at the games we played since last episode. Right, so the big thing that happened this last weekend is Sean came down with the express purpose of reviewing the Draconis Invasion Wrath expansion with me. Uh, when playing the original game, we fouled, especially with playing with two players, we were hammering through games, like 15-minute like games once we got it down. So how long could it take to get through 12 scenarios and finish the campaign? We'll have D join us for some of it and get up to three players. Well, it ends up it takes 13 hours straight followed by a couple of hours the next morning, broken up only by food breaks, and honestly, really not many of those either. Uh, one long extended pizza break is about the, the biggest break we had. Now, honestly, while we talked about some problems with the game, it kept us wanting to play more, mm -hmm. to find those new combos, to see if we could pull off those multiple deck uh, mm -hmm. cycles and runs throughs. Uh, it, it was fun. Uh, I, well, it was fun at the lower player level. <laughs> Yeah, so a big part of this is that we didn't play them all two players, which is a good thing because the game's actually better with three. And we also played some five-player games once at Tori came over. And those five-player games were the biggest drag, and for a few reasons that I didn't want to get into in the actual review. So first off, Cat and Tori had never played Draconis, so there was a teaching part, and this game does have a bit of a learning curve. It definitely does things different from other deck builders, and one thing I'll say right up to, to promote the game, that blew Tori away. Tori loved some of the new mechanics in this game. Though I don't think he ever quite figured out when to shuffle his deck. <laughs> now, second, five players just means more downtime, right? It's, it's five players. But it's not just due to AP. Just silly things like waiting for people to shuffle takes a long time. And there are lots of things that make you shuffle in the middle of your turn. You will play a card and then immediately have to shuffle in the middle of your turn. Like, I, I would love to know how many hours we wasted waiting for people to shuffle that weekend. Now, a big addition to this problem were the specific defender cards that were out for these plays. 
Now, I, I I won't mention names, and I don't think this is too big a spoiler, but you might want to plug yours and go la 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 for a second if you don't want to spoil a bit of wrath. But these, I won't say the names, was a mechanic that when you used the defenders, they got discarded into an opponent's discard pile. And there were a couple of these. Well, when we first saw these, we're like, oh, this is going to be neat because cards are going to be flying around the table, and I can see how they'd all group up together, which actually was very thematic, and they'd be stuck in a player's deck until they could get rid of them. But what actually happened in practice for two rounds of play is just no one bought those cards. And you started with some in your deck, and all everyone did was purge them as quick as possible. So what that ended up doing is gave us no low-level attackers, and the the next attackers in the particular spreads in those games were, like, way expensive, like 70 gold to hire. So there was, like, we had no buildup at the beginning. And it just took forever to get to a point where we were actually killing things. And while that's what rushes the game to the end is usually with five players, it's who kills the most. And this was the one game where we finally had the event deck run out with five players. Like we went through 15 events with almost no one getting terror because no one was killing anything. And when no one kills anything, no one gets terror. Like it was just like a self-fulfilling prophecy of stuff that came together to make it in it was a two and a half hours i think the one game yeah something horrible like that uh so there's also a few uh i i I say take that but sometimes it's player take that sometimes it's game take that uh mechanics so it reached a point where no one even considered planning ahead for their turn because you deal out your hand of cards and it could be shrunken, exchanged, or even completely eliminated yes. by the time it got back around to you. So after a few times of planning out your combos and sorting out your hands so that you'd be able to just, you know, fire out your cards only to have it completely ruined, you just stop trying. And, and that just meant more waiting time. Now, one caveat, we were all kind of picking on Sean for no apparent good reason. No, no, I was not. The, games. I was actually not the one who Cat uh, was the one who completely had no yeah. turn, was completely eliminated. Yeah, had at no one turn, point. But we, most of the time, if someone had to make someone discard a card, we were picking Sean because yeah. it got to be amusing and it just kept being doing a thing. So so I think that was part of it. But yeah, overall, but but I mean, there was just with five players. The game state changed enough that you could have a full plan and whatever. And it wasn't just a matter of the card I wanted was gone. It's the hand I planned to do something with was gone. Yeah, there was there was one card in particular that everybody at the table had to uh, go down this to card. four cards. And so, you know, and you never knew when it was going to come up. <laughs> so, you know, again, why why are you planning? Now, the only other thing I think I really want to say about Draconis and Wrath is that if you do pick it up, don't do what we did. Don't try to finish all 12 in one night. Um, Spread it out, play a game or two, put it away, come back a few days later. Um, Though I have to say I'm impressed. We weren't completely sick of the game by the time we were done. And to be honest, when we were done, I was kind of sick of the game. But, like, I, 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 I would play it again now. Like, that's kind of impressive. But, like, Finishing that felt like I just did extra life. Like, like I had that mental exhaustion. Oh my God, playing games sucks feeling after we finished that. And it's just so weird now that this like kind of indie deck building game is now one of my most played games in my entire collection. Cause I got to admit, there's not a lot of my game collection that I have played. Well, more than 12 times the expansion we played 12 times and the original, I think we played seven. So we're, we're looking at like 21 plays sadly i can't say that about a lot of the games i own and i'm looking around my game room going man i have now played this i, I, I don't mean crappiness is bad but but like i'm like i have played this crappy game more than i played power grid and that's just wrong yeah yeah so i saw comments on the uh in, in the threads on bgg which i spent far too much time on uh i'm talking about people like oh we played all 12 in 15 days and that sounds much more reasonable, even yeah. though those people were talking about how they thought they had burned through it so fast. <laughs> yeah, I should find that thread and be like, did it all in two days. <laughs> Done. All right. <laughs> Enough about Draconis. I wonder if we'll be talking about it in the future weeks. I actually don't know. If, if things open up, like in the next few weeks, I can see it. Because right now I'm still kind of hyped on the game. I don't know how often we're going to return to this game. We'll see. So next up was an afternoon at Brenda and Holly's. Um, Oh man, they made some awesome barbacoa. So that was nice. 
uh, we started the visit with our first play of Roll Camera. And I got to say, I'm impressed. And actually really bummed we didn't fit this in before you left. It, it is it is really solid. Uh, and it does a really good job of integrating the movie making theme with the mechanics. It just felt really well balanced too. So we were playing four players on the easiest difficulty. And it just, there were, there were points where like, oh man, we're going to run out of money. Oh, 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 we're going to run out of time. What can we do? And then we recovered and snagged a victory. And actually, to be honest, we snagged a perfect score. Our quality was as high as you could possibly go in the game. But even with that, it still felt like we could have failed and that we earned that. Now, what I am looking forward to is trying that on normal difficulty or high difficulty or whatever the next, I don't remember the difficulty levels, to see if it gets even more difficult. Yeah, and, and I'm really glad to hear this game played as well as I think I thought it would. Uh, aside from a couple of the mechanics that I think I'd want to see played out, um, yeah. even just a fast skim through the rules, and oh, what a rule book, uh, certainly <laughs> had me feeling pretty confident about being able to play it, uh, as well as it being something that I would likely enjoy. The one thing you were comparing it to a, a video game you played that is completely different is the whole set mechanic is yeah. very unique. So the way you put sets out and the thing you miss is that you're tying up your dice by putting them out there. So as soon as you put them out, the next player's only got like one or two dice. And then you're like, well, I can't even call a meeting now because all my actors are on the set. Like the, the, there's more going on there instead of just place your dice and do a thing, yeah. which was really interesting to see. Now, one aspect of the game that kind of blew me away just because I didn't expect it is there are role-playing elements in this game. Like, like really, actual role-playing elements. They gave me flashbacks to Hero Wanted, Heroes Wanted, which is a superhero-themed Euro game. Every role and role camera has a metagame ability, something the player is encouraged to use and do while playing. And what's interesting is there are multiple different roles and they're two-sided. Well, each side even has a different ability. So you actually have two abilities from each of the different ones. And these include things like the star being able to say, silence, silence, I need to think. And everyone else has to shut up while they're doing their turn or whatever they're doing. Or the director can be like, no, no, do that again, but with more feelings. Come on, do it again. Roll those dice harder. And you have to do what they directed you to do. And like I played the cinematographer. And if anyone at the, at the table pulled out their phones to take pictures i was supposed to like frame the scene and i uh gwen was playing the set director and she was allowed to rearrange her but she didn't do it i was surprised she didn't like move a plant over or something closer to it and i just thought this was a fun unique thematic twist that some groups are gonna love and other groups are never gonna touch it yeah i do like the fact that it's not required yeah. too often games will force silly things as part of gameplay and that really limits the instances that people might play some games. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, it's one thing if you're out in an FLGS and everyone's being loud and annoying. Uh, whereas, you know, if you're playing it with the family, maybe some of the people don't want to have anything to do with that. And they just want to, you know, roll the dice and play the game. Yeah. And it is listed right in the rules, right? It is, it is an optional thing. All right. So I'm going to pause for a second to interact with the chat. So we finally have ads going off and someone's seeing it. So yes. So this is weird because pre-roll is supposed to be off. So you shouldn't have gotten any rolls when you logged in and then just got hit with three more. So weird. we are finally seeing some bad stuff with the new ad system. This is Twitch's new ad system where it runs them automatically and we don't have to hit buttons and it gives us way more pre-roll off. But if that's the case, yes. um, we might, yeah, Owen got them too. So oh. again, not a sub. <sighs> All right. We might have to turn those off if I can figure out how. That's the other problem. All right. Some sausage making. Sorry about that. We do not want to spam our, we want the ads to happen during the coffee breaks and stuff like that. Not while we're recording the show. Maybe we'll just turn off ads all together. If there's a way to, I don't even know if there is a way to with this new system. Cause Probably. this is how Twitch is making money now after yeah. so many people flocked away from them for good reason. All right. Getting back to the games that were played, cut that out. If you wish, keep it in. Doesn't matter either way. Next up. I broke out a classic, a game I have owned for 10 years now, actually possibly 11, because I don't remember when in the year I got it. It's probably 11 years at this point. I taught Deanna and her mom Castles of Burgundy. Now, we almost fit this in before you had to leave on sun Saturday, but that didn't work out, which I don't feel bad, because actually that Timmy's picnic was kind of nice. We talked about some good stuff. Um, with Burgundy fresh in our minds, because we decided to start playing, we wanted to play it on Sunday or sorry, wanted to play on Saturday. So we brought it over Sunday and we played through a three-player game. 
the main reason I brought this classic out is it's now released out of beta officially on Board Game Arena. Um, someone did ask me this question. I don't know if Sean will know this is if it's subscriber or not, because unfortunately both of us are. So I wouldn't know if I could have started the game without it being subscriber. So it, it, if you're a subscriber, you can definitely play it. You may or may not. You might need a subscriber to start it. So we started playing it and very quickly, I was pretty sure Sean had never played, but Deanna also realized she had never, ever played the game despite us owning it for 11 years. Like somehow in the last 11 years, she just never managed to try it. And it was great getting this game dusted off and played again, but it was a reminder why Deanna never actually got to play this game because it's fiddly, so damn fiddly. While I love Castles of Burgundy, I hate the setup involved. And it's not just set up at the start of the game. It is set up every round. You've got all these different colored chits and they're super thin and they're just not fun to play with. Um, you have to sort them out. You have to shuffle them and then you got to place them on the map, making sure you're paying attention to the player counts. Um, like I even went so far as to pimp out my copy of the game by adding baggies for the randomized tiles. So you don't have to shuffle. You just hook up the baggie. Even with that, it takes you a good, I don't know. We never timed it, but we had three players helping to put it out way too long than it should. And then there's this stupid rule that we almost missed where one of the tiles in the three-player game especially switches what type it is every round. And there's barely anything to indicate that on the board. So we actually missed it for a couple of like just fiddly. And then there's all the graphic design problems, the tiny unclear iconography and having to teach or remind players what every single brown building is and what every single yellow tile does every round. And then once you start playing the round, invariably, someone's going to say, wait, what's this do again? Multiple times. You're going to get asked that question a lot. We spent more time referencing the rule book in this than possibly we did in Gloomhaven. I have no idea what they were thinking with the design of these building tiles. Like they show like medieval looking city buildings that are all arches with picked roofs that are all only in two colors. They're just too similar. Why have three different tiny little buildings with blue roofs when you could have had one with blue, red with purple, one with green, and made this easy to see? Now, this isn't just me. For years, people have been asking for a redesigned version of this game, and they did finally put out an anniversary edition. And immediately, the reviews were, what is this? From what I can tell, and what I've heard, and what I've read, it doesn't actually address any of these issues. So I personally stayed away from it. I did not grab the anniversary edition of Castles of Burgundy. Now, if I'm wrong, if anyone out there is listening and listener land, anyone, any of our lobbyists know better, and it does fix these issues, please let me know, because I may be willing to pick up a copy if it does make this better. Now, what I will say fixes every single one of these issues is Board Game Arena. All they did was they offered tool tips. You mouse over a tile, it tells you exactly what it does, and it sets up the board, and it never forgets that you switch between a mine and a castle every other round, because it takes care of it for you. Now, it was nice. Like, I've owned this game for 11 years. I, I don't know if it's been 11 years since I played it. I probably played it in there somewhere. I think I had it in a board game blitz before. But at this point, I'm putting this one back on the shelf. And I think any of my future plays of Castles of Burgundy are going to be online. Yeah, no, I, I'm i actually, I'm being uh, I, I, stubborn on this one. I decided <laughs> we you started the game. Uh, you had talked about starting it. And I said, oh, yeah, I should really, I should really go check a, a, a video um, play guide for that because i find reading rules on board game arena for some reason hasn't sunk in whereas i can literally you know pick up the the draconis tiny little rule book flip through yeah. it and play that day for some reason the rules digital rules have not been sinking in with me but the the video plays really do um and then you started the game before i had a chance to do it so i decided out oh, the heck with it i am going to play through this game having absolutely no idea what I'm doing other than the mouse yeah. over text for, uh, from BGA. Uh, and, and surprisingly, I'm not doing that badly. Yeah. <laughs> now I don't think it's the kind of game where you're going to win. Oh no, I'm, there's no chance I'm going to yeah. win. Um, some games have that. And then you're like, huh, how good is this game? If you can <laughs> win that way? I'm like, I'm pretty sure. No, there's, there's definitely no way I'm going to win. And especially because there were certain things that you mentioned on the weekend that I'm like, Oh, okay. I had no idea that was a thing at all. And I probably should have been thinking about that. Um, but it's totally playable. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's, it's, it's actually extremely now that I've played it. And what I've done is I've switched it now to the classic tiles. 
because at least I recognize them, which is sad because they're the bad ones. Right. But like the new ones are just in bad, but they're just bad in a different way. Like they didn't, they, they changed them without improving them as far as I can tell. I don't know. Um, it's, I, I, it's a solid game. I, 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 I want I, one of the things I want, like if, if I had a wish with the genie, I want an Ian O'Toole designed version of Castles of Burgundy. There we go. I, I think that that there's a life goal, and from what I understand, the Uno tool feels the same. So yes, yes, the I would love to see that happen. Well, if all, if all the stars align someday. Well, how about a look ahead for now? What do you have planned for okay. the coming weeks? So one thing I haven't talked about at all tonight that I do have to mention here. So what three, four weeks in a row now? I've mentioned I need to get some um, box builds. I, I need to build some inserts. Well, I did that this morning because I didn't want to come here and tell all of you again. Well, next week, I'm going to build some inserts and not do it. I got it done. I did it this morning. And that was uh, interesting because I got to the end of the build and tried to put it in the box and it didn't fit. And I honestly don't know here who's at fault. I think um, it's probably me. But Deanna and I, when we were picking out which inserts we wanted to review, we looked at a lot of pages on Folded Space. And I swear that notice wasn't there, but maybe it was. So I'm going to take the blame for it, but it ends up, there are 13 different publishings, 13 different versions of Field of Arl out there, and they don't all come in the same box. And that includes various English versions. It ends up, I have the small box version. So what I would love is if anyone listening to this is in Windsor, Ontario area, heck, almost up to London, I'll go for a drive. Um, and wants to swap copies. I've played my copy twice. It is in mint condition and it's all nice and bagged. I will trade you for your version in a bigger box if you happen to have it. I, I'm not looking to make money here. I'm not looking to 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 spend money. The, maybe if you're, you you want to extort me, you could. But I just want a copy that this box insert works in for. So I have the probably most awkward review of a box insert ever because I built it and it looks great but I couldn't actually use it. So awkwardly at the end of the video, I put all the components in there and kind of lined it up like as if it was a box. I'm sorry, folded space. That's the best I can give you right now. I don't have a box that'll fit in. Um, obviously the meeple size is much to change because there was stuff that didn't fit where it was supposed to fit. So there's more than just the box size that's different in this edition. Like I had cows I had to put stickers on. I don't know, is that not coming every edition? I have no idea. So yeah. So I still have one more box insert to build, and it better fit. Um, I did check. It's the Clans of Caledonia one. I did check. I didn't see any notes on Folded Space. So I do have one more box insert to build. Um, I, I might hammer through that this week. I might not. I honestly don't know. Um, one of the things I am enjoying is we are only doing one review a week. That is much less stressful for me. I'm going to probably keep that up. And I'm going to keep trying to hammer through the pile of shame. Uh, it's going down. Uh, we didn't get to the question about the pile of shame that someone asked earlier, but yeah, the pile of shame's going down and it feels good. And honestly, it feels good reviewing, uh, playing games that I have no obligation to play. I, I didn't expect it to feel different, but it does. It, it really does. And I'm not even saying a bias. It's just a, I feel like I have to play this. Well, I don't have that now. I'm looking at my collection. Going, I want to play that. And we play it, right? Like, oh, board game arena. It's got Castle Burgundy. Well, let's play Castles of Burgundy. And in roll camera, and that insert is literally the end of the pile of obligation. Now, there are some things I would like to do reviews for, like the rest of the Adventuria content, but actual obligations where I've, you know, signed something that says we will review a certain thing by a set time will be done. And I'm looking forward to that, which means something new should show up in the next couple of days. And we're so just going to dive next? in. And we're just going to dive in deep to Agricola on uh, BGA. Not oh, that, that I have any idea. You need to play, play that in person before playing I have it. The no problem. idea. The problem with Agricola on there is it I, depends what edition there is because they completely redid that game when it went from Mayfair Games to um, who got it? Might have been Asmodee, whoever got Agricola um, in the end. I think it went from Lookout Games to Mayfair. Uh, completely changed it. So if it's not the edition that I own, I don't even know if I'll know how to play. So it is Lookout Games. All right. See, I, I, can't, I think I have the Mayfair edition, not the Lookout edition. So well, uh, let's take a look at it. Misery Farm. It's not fun. It's it's just all about trying to mitigate how badly you do and never having enough actions or enough money or enough resources. And then you get the scoring and you think you did well, but you're like, oh, no, I didn't. I don't have that. 
but I didn't actually put a sheep in. And if I just put a sheep in, I would have won. There's a reason we call it Misery Farm. And, and not that I have no any idea what this means, because again, I've never played Agricola. Uh, there will be additional decks coming. Okay, so it's it's at least not the family edition. It has it has the decks, which I actually didn't like the original decks. I think Caverna is a better game. I always have better theme. You're playing dwarves, going on adventures, and digging caves. It's just better than I'm I'm a farmer. Because really, that's you do farm things like you you chop down wood so you can improve your house and you put up fences and animal husbandry like that. That's literally what the game's about. The beginning, you're probably fishing for food because you haven't raised any animals yet or grown any crops and your crop return is going to pay out for three turns. You have to remember to rotate your fields like it's all there. That's what Agricola is. It's it's farm the game. So uh, just just as a quick update, uh, they're they're now listing the most wanted games on the front page of BG, yeah. uh, BGA. Agricola is still up there, um, <laughs> despite the fact that it's been added Maybe it's now. the other edition people want. Uh, but uh, Citadels is the number one oh. game requested with Small social World. Social Deduction Digital. It's like playing Libertalia. There are like, how many honestly. Social Deduction games are on there, and there are already, always people asking for them. I don't know. For some reason... People like social deduction they, they games. They like on lying PGA. through text, I guess. Uh, Small World coming in second. I sold my copy of Citadel's to Tech. <laughs> I no longer have it. Uh, I'm not a fan of that game. Oh, uh, sorry. Agricola, all creatures big and small. Oh, yeah, oh that's that's, a, that's good. It's a two player only version. Oh, okay. Uh, that so, I'm looking forward to actually. That that is a better game than Agricola. That's in my the opinion. third. That's the third. Uh, Le Havre. I have a copy now. Still haven't played it. Considered by many the best Uve game. I have Alien, a copy. Alien Frontiers. Oh, that game. Did we ever play that with you? I don't think so. With the little domes and the the, the map of Mars that's named all like Heinlein's an, an area and Bradbury's no. an area. No. Oh, there, there's a should play with uh, Sean list. Next up, Caverna. There you go. If there you we get, go. You might get, and then Arkham Horror rounds out the list. You know what? Arkham Horror Digital might be good. Part of the problem with Arkham Horror especially with the expansions, is the plethora of cards. Fantasy Flight's famous for this, right? It's the, you go a spot, you draw a card. And well, if you're on this colored spot, you draw this colored card. And if you're in a cab, you draw this colored card. And if you're here, you draw this colored card. And everything's randomized by cards. And one of the cards is always shuffle the deck. It's a Fantasy Flight trope. And I think Arkham Horror, digitally, where I click and it just tells me what happens, might actually be good. I might enjoy that. I did not enjoy the original. Uh, like, I... I, it's Cthulhu when I played it with a bunch of Cthulhu freaks who had all the expansions and it was just painful right. <laughs> because they had all this there was a, they had a bowl it was actually an urn where there were chips they were pulling out of and it was just it felt ridiculously random and I just got a alpha gamer the whole time because I'd never played before like oh oh you did this you should get in the cab and you should go here and then the night gaunt came from the sky and took me out of the cab and brought me to the dreamlands and then I was stuck in the dreamlands for a long time that's what I remember of that night and going, wow, this is not a game for me. <laughs> now a quick shout out and a thank you to some of our VIP guests, our Patreon backers. We greatly appreciate their support. Welcome, Brian Van Beek, the latest tabletop bellhop patron. Welcome and thank you, Brian. Dan Tuzano, always there with her support. Thanks, Mom. The Misdirected Mark podcast, talking about games and game mastery every week. Papa Swick, Joe Swick, thank you. Evil John, thanks, Mr. Carney. Even if you don't like the uh, Star Wars uh, version of Operation, the Mandalorian version of Operation. Oh, I missed that. that. It's, it's, <laughs> I thought you'd dissect Baby Yoda. That'd be so much cooler than just pulling stuff out of the side of his pod. He Not was, that I really like want to dissect Baby Yoda. But... He was disturbed, I think. was. Uh, when that... He was probably thinking you'd dissect Baby Yoda. But you look yeah. at it, it's dumb. It has random stuff just like in a circle yeah, around Yeah, it's yep. We have sold multiple copies of that, though, so it's popular. There we go. Well, that was the double bell. Uh, that means our shifts are coming to an end. We're going to lock the front doors, drop the part cullis, turn off the elevators. Done. Wow, you're stuck in your room. Uh, though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us all over the web as Tabletop Bellhop. One word. You can visit our website at tabletopbellhop.com, find our podcast on your podcatcher of choice, and sign up for our newsletter at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com for we weekly will... updates. 
We will let you out when you finish scenario 12 of Draconis Invasion Wrath. <laughs> As always, <laughs> like links down con- below. <laughs> yes. Links down below. Once you're out, then we'll turn the elevators back on. Oh, we have to leave one running for fire. Per- no, wait, they turned them off during a fire. It's not very accessible, though. Anyway, if you like the content we're providing, if you dig the show tonight, if you had a good time, if you're listening to this and you, you enjoy listening to this, or if you're watching this and you, you think what we're doing is cool, I uh, hit that subscribe button, hit the notify button, thumbs up, like, do all that f- fun stuff. Even better, head over to patreon.com slash tabletop bellhop and become one of our Patreon patrons. Not only will we love you forever because that's awesome and we love the support and it helps us improve the show. Trust me, it has. Watch episode one. Watch now. It makes a difference. Um, It also gives you access to our awesome Discord channel that needs more people. We need more people interacting. It's a great place. The people that are there are awesome. But we play some games and we're having chats about me. We share memes, all the stuff you expect in a little community. I would love to see that community grow. To get into that, you can back at the lowest level. Back us at any level, I'll give you a Discord link. Other than that, there's other cool stuff. Like you can get stuff like our show notes and you can get things like our bonus audio, like uh, usually around three hours of bonus audio minimum every week. So there's also those options. Plus you pay us enough money, we'll play games with you. I don't know how much of a seller point that is, but some people seem to dig it. And if enough of you convince it, convince us, we will run a role-playing game for you, but we're not there yet. Well, that wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For the lobbyists, thanks for joining us. And be sure to stick around and join us in the penthouse suite for the after show and stop by on Sundays for brunch. For Tabletop Bellhop Gaming Podcast, I'm Sean. And I'm Moti. Thank you. And And game game on. on.